Thanks, uh, Dr. Kevin Felstead, for joining me for a conversation. So Kevin Felstead uh, completed his master's degree in US history and politics and a doctorate at, in history at Keele University, where he taught undergraduate courses on the history of crime and punishment in England and Wales since 1800, subsequently employed by High Peak Borough Council and Manchester City Council, Council working in a field of community safety, neighborhood crime and justice. Now, the re reason I uh, read that is uh, from your book, by the way, um, yes, yes. Uh, Justice uh, for Carol, which I read a couple of months ago, is just to give a little bit of background of uh, uh, why we're doing this talk today. Um, so you've got expertise in reviewing evidence in history and in understanding crime and some experience of the law. And of course, you have a story to tell as well about how you got involved in false memory, uh, the British False Memory Society. I'm the director of communications. Right, the director of communications. So the reason for this talk, I thought if, if we put our minds together um, and our different knowledge uh, base together, uh, we might be able to have a kind of a, a meaningful conversation and trying to make sense of the false memory problem in therapy. And secondarily to making sense of that, the false memory problem, uh, I also want to think about how, what we might say. We might kind of try to empty our minds of everything we know about false memories in therapy to help the listener, you know, if they're getting involved in false memory therapy themselves, to help them get out of it, you know, to get, you know, to understand the theories that we understand so that they can get out of kind of cultish kind of therapies. And also for also thinking about the audience being some family members who have just been falsely accused. Um, so that's, that's the idea of, of getting us together and just putting our minds to making sense about, of, of all this uh, societal problem that causes so many people so much pain. One way that I thought we might start out this talk is by talking about the narrative of what happened to Carol and it's described in your book, um, Justice for Carol, of course. I was wondering if you'd like to take the audience through, uh, an audience that perhaps doesn't know the story, about what happened and how you got in involved in this. Yeah, sure. Um, well, where to start? Um, basically, Carol was a, I'd say, a normal person. I would say we were a normal family, by which I mean we were would describe ourselves as a working class family living in the north of England. Um, there are no particular problems in our lives. As far as we're aware, there are no problems in Carol's life. She was a happy person, a happy teenager. As I said before, she could walk on her hands. She could do somersaults. She was a fan of the Bay City Rollers. Um, for her 13th birthday, that's what my parents bought her. And she had the whole outfit on, all that shocking tartan. Um, and everything was good. We we're close, close, close knit family. We played a lot of board games, Monopoly, Cluedo, so on, so on, um, card games. And Carol lived a perfectly normal life. Um, when she got to the sort of age 21, 84, 85, she began to change her personality appeared to have gone a transformation, which was gradual initially, but then dramatic um, as time moved on. She became moody, sullen, argumentative. She picked arguments with my mother uh, on a regular basis. Um, she started to distance herself from the family. The joke I often make is that it was easier to have a telephone conversation with the Pope than it was with Carol. Yeah. Um, over time, she disappeared. Um, she told one of my brothers, she was living in London, she had no problems, and we believed her. We were shocked um, when we found out from a medical records, which we'll come on to, that actually she wasn't living in London at the time she said she was. She was living in a place called Macclesfield in Cheshire, about six miles away from where we live. Um, contact became sporadic. Carol 
made the occasional visit. The last time anybody ever saw her in person was in 1994, when my brothers went out for a meal with her. She appeared slightly nervous. They put that down to not seeing her for years. They had a meal. Carol paid for it, usually. Um, and she drove home to London. Fast track to 2005. Um, we get a phone call from a coroner's officer at Westminster Coroner's Court in London. Um, and the phone call was received by my brother early in the morning. Um, he was lucky that he worked from home. Um, so he was there to answer the phone. Had he not worked from home, who knows what would have happened. And the call went like this. My name is Sharon Marshall. I'm a coroner's officer. Um, I'm phoning to tell you that your sister has died. Now, before we go any further, yes. one thing I should say is that everything I say is factual. Yes. These are inquest transcripts. Um, we have it all released legitimately by the coroner. And everything I'm about to tell you is accepted by all parties. Um, it's not even controversial these days. Um, yes. So she said, you, your, your sister's died two weeks previously. Um, there's a, fu a funeral tomorrow. People are coming from all parts of the country. And she said to my brother, Richard, you're welcome to attend. And Richard didn't know what to say. He was in total shock. Carl was age 41. The telephone call was out of blue. And the coroner's officer realised, we think, that Richard was distressed. And she said, would you like some time to get your thoughts together and speak later? And he said, yes. So he put the telephone down. He walked into the room. He shared a business at the time, another brother called David. And he said, Carol's died. And David said... How did she die? He said, I don't know. But the coroner's office is going to phone me back. Now, at the end of the phone call, the coroner's officer said, are there any family conditions that we need to know about? So Richard asked David, and he said, yes. Um, tell her that mum is in remission from breast cancer. Um, you only track problems, which many members of the family have. Um, and on some family members have had heart problems, not, not us. Um, so two minutes later, and it may even be one minute later, we've been talking about this recently, the telephone rang again. And Richard assumed it was a coroner's officer. He picked the phone up, and a female at the end of the phone said, hello, am I speaking to Richard? He said, yes. And she said, I know you're not one of the, one of the people who harmed Carol, which of course implies that other people have harmed her. Yes. Um, and Carl has died. There's a funeral tomorrow. People are coming from all over the country. Um, absolutely, basically, essentially paraphrasing what the coroner's office has just said, almost with identical words. Um, and invited Richard to funeral. So Richard said, who are you? And she said, that's not important at the moment. And he said, what do you mean it's not important? Um, and she repeated a story. And she just said, and Richard said, well, how did Carol die? And she said she had a difficult childhood. At this point, Richard knew he had to absolutely switch on to the contents of this call. And by instinct, he thought he'd never get a chance to ever speak to this person again. That proved to be correct. And he said, right, how did Carol die? And she said she had a difficult childhood. And he, he went through this two or three times. And then he went back to the beginning and he said, no, specifically, how did she die? What medical diagnosis is there? And she kept saying she had a difficult childhood. And Richard said, no, she didn't, because he'd spent that childhood with her. They were nearer in age than other family members. Um, and the phone call proceeded with repetition until eventually Richard asked the caller if she had something to do with Carol's death at which point she slammed the telephone down. I've never said that statement before, so this is the first time we've revealed that in public. Um, right. The telephone was slammed down. Now, 
Richard went and relayed that story to my brother. He then drove to my dad's workplace and told him that Carl had died. And my dad came back to his house, put his tools down. He was an engineer, um, took his overalls off. And I received a phone call whilst in a, getting into a police van in, in Manchester. I worked for, in a crime and disorder team. I was based in a police station in South Manchester, specifically in Moss Side or on the border of Hume. Um, we had a group called an independent advisory group, which was a group which monitored the police, had monthly meetings, was chaired at command level by the police superintendent or chief superintendent level. It had volunteers from the local community and we all got on very well. And information was so confidential that the minutes of those meetings were distributed but taken away. And no, nobody's allowed to take them home with them. Um, so I was getting into the back of a van. We were going for a meeting in, in a, another area called Trafford in Manchester, where they were looking to set up a similar group. And we were all going along to meet them. I got a phone call from David saying Carol's died. And the phone was buzzing in my pocket. I was ignoring it just as I was stepping into the van, actually. And... Um, Literally, I drove down the M60, went to my father's house. So our lives changed that day. Um, yes. What the coroner's officer um, said, we didn't realise, but it was life-changing. We had a chat and certain things became clear. My dad had a, a second conversation with the coroner's officer and it, Turned out that Carl had died two weeks previously on the 29th of June, 2005, age 41. And we were informed two weeks later, two weeks after she died. And the day before her funeral, a cremation, as it, as it turned out, was meant to go ahead. Mm -hmm. My dad spoke to a coroner's officer later that afternoon. And the conversation went like this. Do you know that your daughter's died? Yes, my son has told me. Pause. Um, Carol um, made allegations pause what allegations why would she make allegations Carol said she was abused and my dad said why would Carol say that and then the conversation moved on and she said do you know that Carol left a document my dad's, dad said what type of document the coroner's officer said a life assessment, a document. My dad said, what is that? He said, it's a summary, an assessment of Carol's life. Now, when we eventually got this document, you know, we took it seriously at the time. It wasn't signed. It wasn't dated. It didn't identify any family member specifically. Everything was generic, mother, father, brother. Um, nobody would leave an assessment of their life without putting a date on it and signing it. Um, and the conversation carried on with the coroner's officer and she said, do you know that Carol changed her name? And dad said, why did she do that? What's her new name? And she said, Carol Myers. And she was born Carol Felser. Now at this point, my dad assumed that the coroner's officer had got Carol mixed up with somebody else. And he was confident in that assumption. And he thought, this isn't Carol. And he said, this doesn't sound like the daughter that I know. And she then said, well, do you know that Carol made allegations? And my dad said, what allegations? Carol said she was abused. Um, and dad was completely perplexed. Um, he didn't, he couldn't compute what he was hearing. And then she played what she thought was clearly the top card where she said, well, there was a trial, wasn't there? And my dad said, trial, what trial? He was in that. He said, well, you and your wife. He said, well, what kind of trial was it? Now, I should state before I continue, that there's no trial yes. ever. No family member has ever been interviewed or asked any questions about any allegations relating to Carol. The whole thing is a complete... Com fabulation so my dad said well when was the trial and she didn't appear to know which was puzzling but she implied it was sometime between 1987 and 1990 
So my dad said, well, I don't know who is giving you this kind of information, but it's all wrong, every bit of it. And he said, I want the, this life assessment document. I want a copy. And the coroner's officer said, it's very upsetting. He said, well, send me a copy anyway. Um, he's a pragmatic person. He's an engineer. Engineers build things. They either work or they don't work. If you build a bridge, it's either safe to go over it or it's not. And there's no gray area. And that's yes. how he thinks. Um, and basically, when we eventually got this life assessment document, it contained allegations that Carol's abuse and birth, physically, emotionally, sexually. It alleged that she'd been a child prostitute, hadn't attended school because of the abuse. It alleged further that my parents were the leaders of the satanic cult, um, which was intergenerational. Um, it claimed that we were responsible for the worst crimes barring genocide. These included murder, at least eight multiple rapes, multiple sexual abuse. It could claim that professionals, including members of the judiciary and the police, were members of our satanic cult. There were allegations that Carol had been abused in Conservative Party headquarters by two of Margaret Thatcher's, um, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's cabinet. Um, there were even allegations later on that Howard Shipman, the serial killer, was a member of the cult. And the allegations were so fantastical that nobody would believe them. Yes. Except the authorities. And they did. And these, these allegations were not meant to be mythical. These were meant to be definitive events that genuinely happened, that really happened. Um, and we were thrown into a world of total confusion. Um, and my dad had said to Connor's officer that he was going to contact our local police force, which is Greater Manchester Police, um, and prove that these things didn't happen. So it's comical that it wasn't so serious. He phoned up, I think it was their data protection office, and he said, look, I want you to search the details of a trial, but before you do, I can tell you it didn't happen. Now, she then said, well, when was the trial? He said, we have no idea. I believe it's meant to have taken place between 1987 and 1990, but search any time. So they did a paper search and a search on the computers and they couldn't find any record of the trial, which isn't surprising because there wasn't one. It's meant to have collapsed after three days due to lack of evidence, we were told. Um, so my dad got the letter from the police, sent it off to the coroner. I said, we now want the life assessment document, which was fact some time later. And when we received that document, outlining all these allegations, we were expecting it to be distressing and upsetting. We'd been warned it would be. It wasn't. It was comical. It was so ridiculous, so yes. fantastical, that it didn't upset us in the slightest. It made us quite angry yes. and very annoyed and frustrated. Um, and even the first line was wrong. It said, I was born in a three-up um, story house in Manchester. Carl wasn't born in Manchester. She was born in Stockport. So the first line of her life assessment was inaccurate and every other detail was demonstrably inaccurate. Yes. The central definitive traumatic allegation of Carol's life was that she's supposed to witness, according to the life assessment document, my mother murdered, murdered another baby whose name happened to be Joan Julie, sit Carol on top of the body and then set fire to the house, which was burnt to the ground, presumably, to conceal what she'd done. The correct chronology of events is that there was another baby. Her name was Joan Julie. She was ill from birth. She died. I used to think it was two months, but it was four months. I've, I've been recently reading the death certificates. She died aged four months. Um, she had, um, she was Down syndrome. She had a defective heart. One day, my dad received a telephone call on a landline at work. There were no mobiles then. Yeah. No emails in terms of communication, no Facebook, it's a very different world. And it said, Joan Julie is deteriorating. I've been trying to contact your wife. You came, you need to come to the hospital. He left work in his overalls. He arrived there, was shown into a side ward, and Joan Julie died in front of him. And it's very distressing. And Joan Julie was born and died according to her death certificate, so we don't need to debate it. Yes. In 1962. 
there was a house fire. It was a tragic accident. Fortunately for us, it was reported on the front page of our local newspaper, which was called the Stockport Express. And I have a copy of that. We yes. all do. Um, um, these firemen were brave people. Basically, what had happened is an accidental house fire. My mother was in the back garden hanging washing on a line. Um, the fire went. My mother's screaming, my babies, my babies. I was age three. My, I've got twin brothers. They were age two. The firemen came. They had no breathing equipment, nothing. Um, they crawled in, in smoke, on the hands and knees, um, for reasons which are still not clear. My brothers and I were upstairs, and they were in a wardrobe. Now, presumably, I put them in the wardrobe to protect them. We do joke about this. The firemen came up in a ladder, came in through the window, um, found me, rescued me, pulled my brothers out of the wardrobe, and as the firemen got onto a ladder, the whole window frame collapsed. My goodness. The house was burnt to ground. It was witnessed by the whole neighbourhood. This is quite a dramatic event. And indeed, when I was um, about 17, 18, I had a job, and a person I was working with said, did your parents used to own a house in Lower Didsbury in Stockport? I said, yes. She said, was it burnt down? I said, yes. She said, I witnessed it. My mother lived near me and she took, took me to it and all the neighbourhood was out. Um, that took place in 1963. Carol was born in 1964. Right. So uh, the events are not only incorrect, actually inaccurate, but they're impossible because yes. Carol wasn't alive when they took place. Yeah, there's no question that Carol and the authorities accepted these events definitively. And Carol had 20 years medical treatment based on these events being absolutely accurate. Um, and nobody bothered to check the facts. They're easy to check. My parents went to the local library after these allegations were put to us, went through the microfiche. It was my mother they found, actually. She found the newspaper report um, about the fire. They went to the birth and um, death registry and got copies of Joan Julie's death certificates and Carol's birth certificate. And while they were doing it, they also got copies of my grandparents' death certificates because we were also accused of grandparental abuse. So all of those things were sent in. It was quite um, a distressing thing. Uh, yes. I have all these death certificates in a folder in my office. Um, that's how we started. Yes, well, all of that is strong converging evidence of a real false memory in, in, a, real, in a real case. I mean, we have lots of evidence of false memories inside the lab and, and so on. But the, the, it, it's just one of many examples of things being remembered that are impossible to have happened. That, that, that was the, the shocking part of it. When Carol disappeared from our lives, Yes. what we didn't know is that she'd been having um, counselling, initially hypnotherapy, yes. in 1985. And in the note in her medical file, there's a record and it says Carol um, it's become clear after three sessions that Carol's been abused physically, emotionally, sexually from birth. Carol has no memory of these events, but further details will be revealed in due course. Now there's only two people in this room. Carol's not making allegations because she's saying she's got no memory of it. So yes. who's suggesting it happened? It's a classic case of assuming there must be trauma there. You know, there's no memory of it. So obviously, subsequently, they, they went digging for those memories and started to construct them. Yeah, well, Carol initially went to her doctor with headaches. And she yes. had, she alleged, repeated headaches. Um, she was examined by three consultants, separately and independently. One of those consultants said, well, there's no family history of any significance. Now, that's quite a strong statement, yes. given what we now know. Yes. Um, another one thought that Carol may have migraine um, because there's a slight history of that with other family members. Um, another one thought that it could be, Carol's a nurse, a trainee nurse, it could be stress due to her taking her finals. When I took my finals, I had strong headaches and yes. I expect a lot of people do. 
Um, and because they couldn't find a, a sort of diagnosis, a prognosis, Carol was referred to psychology to check if the problem was in her mind. Yes. It was in fact psychological. And she was given what certainly looks like hypnotherapy. And then from that point in the mid 1980s, the allegations start being made. It escalates about yes. 1990 to 1991. Yes. As satanic ritual abuse is, is kind of coming over the waters from the States. Yes. Then we get the first allegations of satanic ritual abuse. And the allegations get more and more wild over time. But they are documented in her records as really fence that definitely happened. She's meant to have been assaulted a couple of times including by Margaret Thatcher's cabinet members, the men's assault uh, in Conservative Party headquarters with a claw hammer. That's not the only allegation with a claw hammer. Now, one doesn't have to be a medic to understand that if you are assaulted in that way, there will be injuries. Unquestionably. <coughs> there weren't any. There's so many convergent indications that these were false memories. I mean, how unlikely is it that she was involved in uh, Margaret Thatcher's um, cabinet, you know, for example. Let's go back a second to just thinking about how any professional could possibly believe that a headache would indicate a hid hidden traumatic memories. What kind of theory could produce that? I think we have to look at time scales. Um, and clearly at this time, particularly in the United States, you're beginning to get this recover memory kind of problem is emerging. Yes, or re-emerging. Yeah, re-emerging. Yeah. And you've got, you've got people who think that adult problems, which we all get, relationship problems, um, you know, financial problems, um, stress, anxiety. People, most people have something like that, bereavements. Um, but they believe that the adult problems are caused by something that happened in your childhood. And that these events are so traumatic that the mind defaults to blocking them out and wiping them out entirely. And they can only be retrieved with the help of a skilled counsellor. Yes. Normally a psychotherapist, but it doesn't have to be psychotherapy, it can be a hypnotherapist. But to my mind, the names are irrelevant. It's the product you're using. If you're taking somebody back yes. and regressing them back in time, um, and this is where all the past lives regression, which is very fashionable, it's the same techniques. Um, and that theory, that notion, was emerging in the United Kingdom. Experts, in inverted commas, were dispatched from the United States to give talks. There were pamphlets, books were being written, Michelle Remembers was published initially in Can Canada, um, later in the US. Um, it became an international bestseller, Michelle went to see a psychiatrist uh, who she later married. She was actually married to somebody else when she saw him. We'll come on to ethical boundaries. Or yes, well, well, it, it's quite a common theme of um, ethical boundaries being transgressed in therapies that try to uncover trauma, re yeah, repress I, trauma. I, I, I have many other examples apart from Carol's case. But yes. Michelle came to believe that she was a victim of satanic ritual abuse. She'd put, been put in graves, snakes, everything that one, the worst things that could ever happen to anybody. The GP, who knew the family, knew her parents, knew her, had her medical records, um, said these events can't be true. That's right. Uh, it was later exposed, I think there's a Daily Mail in the United Kingdom, as an elaborate hoax. Um, and, and really, but the point was, that whole notion of that book went statewide in the United States and the ideas came over here and with Carol my view is that people were looking for our Michelle once we yes. had a Michelle in the United Kingdom yes then we can launch this um, and get this going um, well that this raises a question do you think Carol read a book or a couple of books or maybe more before she was brainwashed by the therapist, you know, how much agency do you think Carol had in learning this theory? We, we are certain of it. Um, there's very little internet back then, but Richard remembers one book in particular on her shelf, and he can't recall the title. Oh, that's a shame. 
but she started speaking like a sort of um, a textbook, yes. like a self-help manual. Um, and that comes up in other cases with the British Lost Memory Society, where people, the language changes, are talking as if they've read a script. And that's how Carol became from that point. This, this is symptomatic of belief systems that are not grounded in evidence. You know, not just um, believing in uh, repressed memories, but other belief systems too, you know, such as Marxism. You know, the followers can start to behave in a cult-like way where they're parroting what they've read, you know, rather than free thinking. And, it, and you see that in new, new movements today too, which are not re related to repressed memories, but they also have the same kind of untestable set of theories. You get these uh, changes of personality in, 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 in other un, unfalsifiable theories too. We, we think that when Carol initially had psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, um, and I'll talk about what happened to her after that, that people were looking for template in this country. Um, some of these people involved in Carol's, I hesitate to call it treatment, but I will use that word um, um, generously, um, became kind of very well known in their fields. And they built careers on this myth of repressed trauma. Um, the problem I have in general is I'm trained as a historian. Um, and history, it certainly was a rigorous discipline when I studied it. It was. Based on evidence, one examines the evidence, there are always gaps in that evidence, but one analyzes it and you draw your conclusions based on the evidence. So it's evidence based. And you look for disconfirming examples in history as well. Yeah, you, you, you don't accept anything. That, you know, carte blanche, you, you literally want, it's got to be evidence-based. Um, and sometimes one's own theories don't stack up. In my PhD, I applied modern criminological theories to the past, um, with the exception of one regarding domestic violence and the idea of control function. None of them stood up. Yeah, They're lovely and, theories. And you didn't stick with them, right? So yeah, no, you abandoned them, theory. you know. And you, 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 know, you said that. But when, when it's about belief, when you have a theory, and it's about finding anything that confirms your belief and dismissing anything that doesn't fit in with your belief yes. system, well, that's going to lead to bad outcomes. Yes, it's confirmation bias. And yeah, I, don't, I don't know how these therapists were rejecting disconfirming evidence at the time. I don't think the argument against repressed memories was very strong, strongly developed in the 1980s. Yeah, Mark, Mark Pendergrass, The Memory Warp, it's all there. It's a social and cultural history. In my opinion, it will never be better as a history of the last 25 years, and it's all there. Yes. Now, why is it that this book hasn't sent shockwaves through our culture? It hasn't, because it's about belief. The people who should read this book don't read it, yes. won't read it. And that's, um, and that's then confirmation bias, yes. Yeah, don't even read it because everything's in there. Um, it happens to be a very well written book as well. But it's all there. The history of the last 25 years is all laid to bear. Well, it's 30 years, isn't it now? That's 30 years. It's all there. And yes. particularly beginning in the US, the UK was behind the US. So they set up their false memory society in 1992. Is that correct? Or in in the US, something like yeah. that. And we were a year behind them. Yeah, in um, the UK. And, and yeah. the person, Roger Scott, that who set up our False Memory Society in the UK, he'd been accused by a family member, members, and he went over to the, one of their conferences. He didn't know until he attended that conference what was actually going on in, in the psychotherapy room. He had no idea. And that's where we, we came from. I had no idea at that time that my sister um, was caught up in it. Um, I remember, you know, the, the kind of um, the satanic panics, primarily because of the Orkney Islands. And there's one in Rochdale in the, in the northwest of England. And I remember reading about that. And this daft MP we had at the time, he was telling the police to dig up um, Saddleworth Moor. But I turned, I turned the pages over in the press. 
one of my brothers followed it all, followed everything. So 2005, when we began to get information, particularly when we got the life assessment document, he said, not the satanic panic. No, surely not. He recognized it for what it was. Yes. And that's where the trail started getting hot. That's where we could start stepping back and, and looking at it from a historical point of view and an evidential point of view. Yes. And that's when the whole silly story and the myth of what's supposed to happen to Carol collapsed like a, a set of dominoes once you checked, checked a few facts. It, was, yes. it wasn't difficult. So one of the problems we've identified here is a refusal to look at disconfirming evidence. You know, it's like a yeah. confirmation bias. Like, so that book by Pendergrast is available to everybody to look at. And uh, there's still a lot of people who believe in um, the trauma and dissociation uh, theory of, of repressed memories and so on. Yeah. The question is, why are they not looking at disconfirming evidence? What is getting in the way of contacting somebody who's, who's developed these false memories and, and giving them a book about false memories and, and then yeah. them coming to their senses? They, they, they want to believe it, don't they? So if, if you look at it from a narrative point of view, yes. cultural point of view, um, what a story, isn't it? You know, somebody's been abused. They've repressed it all. We've seen it in all of the films. Jason Bourne washed up on the beach. Um, but that's a traumatic injury to his brain. That's why he can't remember the Bourne identity. They want to believe that story. And what a story it is. If it was true, you know, we've actually got this person who had all this trauma. The mind's entirely repressed it. I've unblocked it. And now this person can discuss it, can find coping mechanisms and, and get well. The issue is this, isn't it? Let's be extreme. Um, because one of the key proponents of these arguments in the United Kingdom, Dr. Valerie Sinison, uses this example herself. He likens um, survivors of, you know, repressed memories, as she calls them, to victims of the Holocaust. Now, that is such an insult. It's also stupid, anti-science. But let's use her example. How is it we know anything about the Holocaust? Surely, if this theory stood up, those events would be entirely repressed because right. the mind won't be able to cope with it. So it'd have to block it out. The opposite is true. Those people can never, ever, ever forget those events. They may not remember every single detail, they may not remember every date, but they will never forget the family members and their friends who were murdered in, in that horrible, horrible whole series of things. So yes. it's impossible. And I could, we could go on forever, couldn't we, in history? Sometimes it's so easy to find that disconfirming evidence without even getting up and opening a book. If your mind is set up to be oppositional to look for that disconfirming evidence. Yeah, let, let's use another analogy. Look at the Munich aircraft, Manchester United football team, where half the team were wiped out. Some of the players who survived it went on to have successful careers, but they've never, ever forgotten it. How could they? In fact, they've been interviewed repeatedly, not as much nowadays about yes. it. But, but that event um, is, is, is absolutely unforgettable. How yes. could you ever forget that? There may be bits you can't remember yeah. if you're unconscious or you're, you're, you know, you're on a stretch and you take it to hospital. But everybody knows involved in that event, that that event happened. Yes. It can't be repressed. It's, it's not possible to repress it. it. It'd be wonderful if we could repress these things, you know, but it, we can't. Uh, that, that's right. And, and I think there is a, um, a nuance to these kind of events, uh, you know, so when you remember these events, you sometimes, the traumatic events, you sometimes remember them inaccurately. So, you know, Bobby yes. Charlton might remember seeing a different scene than he actually reports um, uh, 50 years later. But the core point here is that he doesn't forget that it happened, right? He doesn't forget some vivid aspect of the trauma, even if some of the details get messed around a little bit. Let me, let me tell you a story about my false memory. I've got, yes. I've got quite a lot of them, but here's one of them. My mother told me, my brother Richard, during childhood, that another baby um, who, was, who, who was stillborn, Christopher, 
um, still born in 1963. Okay, um, so he's died at birth. And my mother said that when Christopher died, she was given another baby to hold by the nursing staff who felt sorry for her. I said this baby was thalidomide, i.e. he had no arms and legs. And she told me, she told Richard. If she told my other brothers, they don't have any recollection of it. Now, Rich and I always believed that story. We spoke about it a few times, not, not regularly. So when I came to write the Justice of Carol book with Richard, I said, we need to put this in there. And it took me about two weeks to compose this short chapter. And I thought it was the best writing in the book. Uh, and you want it to be emotive. You want it to encapsulate what's happened. And uh, you want it to be dramatic. And I gave a copy of the chapter to my dad. And he read it with a, a smile on his face. I said, it's a great piece of writing, Mark. He said, there's just one problem with it. I said, what's that? He said, it didn't happen. So I said, well, it did because my mother told me. And she told Richard. He said, well, I was there. He said, your mother was on Pethody. He said, she didn't know what day it was. He said, and think about it. You wouldn't get a mother who's given birth to another baby to give it away at gun, gunpoint. He said, then why hasn't the baby got any arms and legs? And then when I thought about it, I realised how gullible we'd been, we'd been yeah. believing this story. But when your mother tells a story like that, well, you don't think she's lying. Um, and she'd obviously believed that had happened, but she's heavily medicated. Oh, of course, um, yes. The events were impossible. Yes. Um, where's the baby come from? And, you know, if a baby dies, it's terrible, isn't it? But the nurses are not going to take somebody else's baby and give it to you to hold for a couple of hours. Um, and we'd always believe that, but it's simply the facts disprove it. Um, and when my dad told me that, I was actually quite flabbergasted, to be honest. Yes. So a little bit gullible. Yes, I think we all have um, false memories, or at least memories that are constructed in, a little bit differently than, than they actually happened. Yeah, it, it, memory, you know, as Pendergrass says, it doesn't work like a filing cab cabinet. Others say it doesn't work like a video recorder. Um, yes. It's fallible. Um, we don't, we reconstruct, don't we? We, we? we interpret events and we may think, well, if I, I, if I said to you, what were you doing on this day 10 years ago? What you may do is think what you should have been doing on this day 10 yes. years ago. Slightly guess it. You may get lucky, but you may not, probably. Yes, uh, well, nobody can remember that kind of uh, detail. And even when they try to, maybe there's a motive to, to, to remember a day like that, such as a, a legal case, and then they, they report that they do remember. They're probably reconstructing from schemas and um, from stereotypes and, and so on. Um, even when you... That. There's, there's only... There's only uh, you know, maybe 50 individuals in the world who can remember things from a specific date um, many years ago. Um, and that's because they rehearse the dates over and over again. They're people with highly superior autobiographical memory. Yes. And, and I uh, researched them in, in, in 2013 because I, I, I knew that without the constant rehearsal, I knew that they would probably have malleable memories just like anybody else. And um, I faced quite a bit of opposition getting this, this study going. And uh, when I did study them, I did indeed find that even people with superior memory have malleable memories so that, you know, they, yeah. they incorporated misinformation into their memory when we gave it to them. Um, they uh, misremembered news events when we suggested it, not all of them, but a lot of them. And they re misremembered words. Now, these are the only individuals in the world who seem to, who, who, who could possibly seem to be examples of, of people who video record their experience. But when you investigate it in the lab, they couldn't, they did not record their experience. If those with the best memories in, in the world have malleable memories, then, then we all do, is what I concluded from that. I, I tested this theory in Crown Court um, during a break, during recess, with a, a criminal barrister. Now, the people involved in this case are now in prison, serving long sentences for false memory type allegations. But one of them has been cross-examined, 
about events that were meant to have taken place 20, 25 years ago. And I said to the barrister over lunch, I said, OK, can you tell me what you were doing on this day 10 years ago? I said, well, of course I can't. I said, well, why do you think that your client is going to be able to answer that question? Going further back in time, I said, you could go and consult your diaries. You might be able to ask your clerk um, what you did that day. And you, with the job you do, maybe one of those people can find out what you did 10 years ago. But um, in general, if you, you ask me that question, I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing 10 years ago today. Yes, that's, that's right. There's, there's overwhelming evidence that memory is constructed and perception is constructed too. Yeah. Um, I mean, thousands and thousands of um, articles on memory and attention and perception, all of it converges. Even the applied cognitive psychology converges with the idea that memory is constructed. You know, it's, it's as certain a finding as other, other, other theories in science such, you know, that, that are also well supported, such as evolution, for example. So it's almost like it's become a fact that memory is uh, constructed. There's so much re um, um, uh, converging evidence. I'll, I'll just give you one example. Even in neuroscience, when you examine uh, the reconsolidation of memory and uh, examine the neurotransmitters that are involved in the, in the reconsolidation of memory, even in that area, you find that memories are slightly altered every time you recall them. So you recall something and then you reconsolidate it back into your memory. So it's changed a little bit every time you remember. So that's just one example of many areas of converging evidence. So that's the evidence. Now, if you combine the evidence with just rationalism, like thinking it through about whether you can remember, like you were talking about, whether you can remember 10 years ago. So the knowledge is already there. It just takes some kind of thought experiment to think about how poor our memories is. And then people realize how poor their memories are, even without doing experiments, you know, just by thinking it through. Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? If, if you go back to previous times, you know, Shakespeare, a Renaissance man, a Renaissance person, yeah. who said, you know, draw your knowledge from wide sources and, you know, learn from all different disciplines. Um, Rousseau, you know, use your own critical thinking to determine whether something may be accurate or inaccurate. Um, I won't even get into John Locke. But, oh, I wish you did. I love John Locke. I, I do too. I do too. Yes. Um, particularly the social contracts, but maybe that's another day. But he's basically based in evidence Exactly, exactly. And exactly. not only, not only exactly. is, is, is John Locke based in evidence, but when you are based in evidence, a sane society with sane beliefs seems to emerge. Yes. When you're not based yep. in evidence, yep. and, and, and by the way, a Lockean society becomes non-authoritarian, right? So we can see connections here. Like, you, you know, uh, for the most part, they become non-authoritarian compared to, compared to states who don't use Locke's philosophy of you know every man is equal and so on yeah. but when you are not empirical and you're theoretical only and your theory doesn't touch evidence think about the 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 authoritarianism that has come from that in politics right and you also get authoritarianism in psychotherapies that are based upon theory that is disconnected from evidence right such as such as repressed memory theory um it's it's so karl popper criticized freud's original theories as being unfalsifiable right which is similar to other problematic uh, theories and he said because it's unfalsifiable it's untestable therefore it's not scientific and sure enough sure enough people who maintain this belief in repressed memories periodically create psychotherapies that become authoritarian within themselves, you know. Frederick Cruz said, fraud yes. is a liar, a fraud, a drug addict, and a bully. Um, yes. what, what is probably his parting shot. And he, his view was, you don't let the patient or the client leave the therapy room unless they admit that something has happened to them. Yes. Uh, the whole Oedipus complex is just daft. It's oh, it's daft, yeah. 
it's just, just completely daft. Let's examine it just a little bit. Let's play ball with this idea. Why is um, the idea of repressed memory disconnected from evidence? Well, it's, it's about belief, isn't it? It's purely about belief. You don't need evidence if you believe something. So the example that's often given is a flat earth society. What happens in these cases, uh, certainly with my sister and in the archive of British False Memory Society, is that the, the patient becomes a prisoner. They become imprisoned. A prisoner and, of belief, right? Yeah, they are. And, and they, they're not allowed to have independent thought. They're, they're the minds are the psyche is penetrated with these daft theories which are untenable, don't stand up to any evidential scrutiny, and their lives are ruined. They become ill, they often die prematurely. One of the scariest things in the sister's case, but indeed in the whole archive of British False Memory Society, is that these people are being abused, and they're often being abused by women. So we have women abusing women. Because of their systems now in other words you're now, saying the therapists yes the therapists are, are, are so in, in effect abusing them by giving them yeah, bad therapy yeah because predominantly you know it still is a female um, not as much as it was but there are more females than males certainly yes. carols um part of the one person everybody was a female um but the archive british folks when there's all of these cases so you go to get help and then somebody has this convoluted belief system and they will switch off and anything um, which will, you know, conflict with that system. So obviously, if you're giving me counselling and I come in to you and say, well, all my family's been abusing me, and surely all the counsellor suggests it, as is normally the case, surely the starting point should be looking at the whole picture, yeah. looking at the whole picture. And what, what the archive of the BFMS shows is that you can go there often the first session, never more than the third session, really. And you'll be asked, if you get any adult problems, let's talk about your childhood. Let's talk about the relationship with your father. Do you think you may have been abused? Now, once you implant that seed, if you said that to me, I'd be out of there, okay? But if you just go down that, then let's say you go home now, Google, have I been abused? Um, and you can type in the checklist, whole symptoms, which are meant to explain why things may have been problematic in your adult life. And it's a slippery slope. There's a motive, isn't it? The promise is that those problems would go away if you go down this unlikely path. Yep. yep. And if you, if you go back to the late 80s, early 90s, this is also, you know, depressed memories meant to be the biggest breakthrough with Freud. We know Freud was wrong, but this is what it's seen as. Yeah. It, clinicians this is this is like massive you it, know it's, it, it's so complicated because a lot of the th um thinkers and theorists who revived the idea of repressed memory from freud would criticize freud very strongly yep. so it's so confusing for the reader to understand that not only is freud wrong you know and and these new theorists say that but these new theorists are also wrong about repressed memory. And the question is, how do we know that repressed memories um, either are very rare or they don't exist? How do we know that? Well, it, it's interesting, is it? You know, if you look at the charity I work for, the same would apply in memory in America. We believe the cases we get are the tip of a very large iceberg. I think so. Okay? And we can't know the information we haven't got. And we can only hypothesize about it. But it is astonishing when I staff a helpline, how many people phone up and don't have a clue what is happening. They know they've been accused, normally, not always, normally by a family member. Yes. And this person's now gone to see a counsellor for an adult type problem. And they're suddenly claiming, I now remembered um, all these things you did to me in childhood. I mean, we even had one case um, a couple of years ago uh, where a son was accusing his mother of sexual abuse during infancy. Yes. And he took those allegations right back to age one. So we know that the brain isn't sufficiently developed to remember that. Yeah, infantile then, amnesia. Yeah, and then he, he claimed then to witness his own birth. Then as the sessions carried on, he then started talking about past lives. Right. 
So we can be fairly confident that this, what sounds like regression type therapy, is, is resulting in false memories. Yes, exactly. So I think it's very well established that we know that false memories are possible in these environments. I mean, there's, there's quite a consensus now that that's true. Um, but I take the, the stronger um, um, position of, and the question is, how do I know this? You know, I, we, uh, maybe you take this position too, Kevin, that I doubt all reports of repressed memory. So why, why do we take this um, position of doubting the existence of repressed memory? Well, it, it, it conflicts with basic common sense, I would say. Yes. So if somebody is suggesting they, they witnessed their own birth, that's not physically possible. Um, we know that. Um, yes. They can't remember. But it conflicts with the science on memory. And yes. let's move away from the term false memory zones. Let's talk about memory in general, memory per se. Yes. There, there are thousands of publications on them. Um, you've written some of them. Um, the, the science is very clear. We may not understand everything about the brain and everything about memory, but we do know that you're, you are much more likely to remember trauma than forget it and entirely repress it, okay? And setting aside traumatic brain injuries, yes. which is completely different. Um, Professor Chris French, um, Goldsmith University in London, says that the, this, the psychotherapy room is a perfect kind of um, sort of environment to generate false memories. Yeah. You have somebody there in an authority position, somebody who's vulnerable, and with an unskilled practitioner, um, it's very easy to end up generating false memories, even unwittingly. And yes, yes. Um, when, I, when I think about this uh, question, I have to come back to the fact that when traumas are laid down, there's usually, if you take the, the definition of trauma to be something that scares you, right? That being scared usually comes along with a, a rush of a neurotransmitters called epinephrine, right? And the research on epinephrine's effect on memory is that it increases the consolidation of memory, right? So when you do feel a trauma, that it's much more likely to be laid down in memory. Um, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I doubt repressed memories occur. Um, and the second thing is on the recall of the purported recall of repressed memories is extraordinary and it needs extraordinary evidence, right? Yeah. So because you have the, it's, it's extraordinary because the theory goes that you have forgotten the memory completely that you did not even know happened. And then you kind of recall it as if by magic in great detail. I mean, I, mean, I mean, in exquisite detail sometimes um, after the period of repression. And it just does not, it's not convergent with memory research. Um, it, it also doesn't stack up with what we know about real victims of sexual abuse. Yes. You know, of which there are plenty, um, much more than, than false memory type um, allegations. Um, they don't forget it. They may not remember every detail. Yes. Um, it is traumatizing. Some of them have coping mechanisms. One of the strange things that's happened since I've done, I've done this job is people have come up to me and told me things. And I've met several people who have said that they were sexually abused. Um, I don't have any reason to disbelieve them. They said they could never forget it. They yes. wish you could. Um, some of them say they put it in a sort of metaphorical drawer, which they close, um, but yes. they've always remembered it. That's the difference. They may not remember every detail, particularly the younger with the passage of time, but you can't forget it. So in 1986, I was a pedestrian in a road traffic accident. Yeah. I was hit. Um, I was lying in the road. I was with my family at the time and I was unconscious intermittently. I was taken into hospital and um, I was placed in intensive care and the bits of that I don't remember. During my lengthy stay in hospital with, in, I 
compound fracture of the left femur. That's where the bones come through. Oh my goodness. Fracture, open flesh wounds and a multitude of other injuries. I don't remember every detail of it. There's quite a lot I don't remember, but there are certain things that I could never forget that happened to me. That yes. includes with my assistant, a, a, a lovely professional enthusiastic physio, um, refracturing between us the fracture because he pushed the exercise too much. It includes me getting scabies, a chest infection. It includes me getting gangrene, for which I was readmitted to hospital for further surgery to clean out the wound. So I can't remember every detail of it, but the actual main event, how could I forget it? You know, and the physical evidence is there. One leg is different than the other now. Yeah. Well, well it, is, it is true that you can not think about things for a long time. Yep. And it's in your memory, but it's not repression, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I'll give you an example. Um, just a few years ago, I heard um, Pavarotti's Nessun Dorma again for the first time in, you know, 20 years or whatever it was. And I started to remember the 1990 World Cup with Gascoigne, yes. I think it was. And, 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 yeah. and there was lots of these little memories that I just hadn't thought about for a long time. And I suppose that can happen with trauma too. But it's not repression. And I worry that some people out there are encountering the recall of things that happened in childhood that are true. And instead of calling them just normal forgetting and normal remembering, they, I'm worried that they're thinking that this is repression, you know, when it's not repression. It's just the fading of memories and then getting a cue for the memory later on and then recalling some something that is uh, appraised to be abuse i i think that's possible but, i mean i think we're all confused about memory aren't we so all the academic surveys that have been done um with chris french and james Oss have done several of them with members of the public and uh, with members of the judiciary with legal professionals with um, counselors um, psychologists, they all show that what we actually believe about memory is not necessarily true, and That's that we've right. all got perceptions about it. Now, bearing in mind that members of public sit on juries, and if judges have got um, wrongful perceptions about memory as well, and we know the legal profession, according to these surveys, um, some of them do believe things that are not supported by the science, then you've got a dizzy um, recipe for disaster. Yes. And the outcome in these cases, when it goes wrong, is lethal. People are wrongly incarcerated. Yes. Their lives are ruined, reputational damage, financial collapse, family breakdown. And what is also awful, if you think about, my sister's a good example, what's it like where you think somebody's done these things to you um, and they're not correct? It ruins your life. And you think that your family have tortured you and abused you. Um, how can you have a, a, a normal existence believing in these things which are wrong? It's, a, it's absolute tragedy. And a lot of these cases don't in, end up in court. They don't get, end up being discovered, you know. And there may be thousands, I don't know, or even millions of people going around there, out, out there in the world believing that they may have repressed memories, even though they don't know what that is. Yep. And just imagine the family dynamics. If you believe that you may have repressed memories, even that affects the family dynamics. You know, you go home to celebrate Christmas with your parents and you just are never sure whether you have severe trauma and that's the reason why you have asthma as an adult or something like that. It, it, it gets in the way of closeness, doesn't it? I mean, there's going to be a, this glass barrier between you and your parents. Even in cases, that, most of the cases of BFMS do not result in police involvement, but yes. a significant number of them do. So to, by way of example, over the last four or five years, we've had something like 28 cases of no further action. Where, that's where the police have investigated. Yes and not taking it to court. We've had four not guilty verdicts in separate non-related cases which have resulted in, in trials, criminal trials. So the jury's come back 
Uh, oddly enough, in each of those cases, they, they came back within 30 minutes, which if you think about it, you walk to your jury room, presumably put the kettle on, then you have to do your deliberations, and to yes. get back in the courtroom in 30 minutes um, is pretty strong, I think. We've had another case that was always going to trial that didn't go to trial um, when the defence um, submitted expert witness testimony um, and the prosecution called an expert witness and they both agreed that this complainant genuinely believed the things that he was saying, but they were unlikely to be correct. And, and all of these uh, cases the involve, all of these yeah. cases you're talking about involve purported repressed memories yep. um, that re re result in false accusations, right? Yes. And it's a perfect opportunity to ask you this question. You have been very successful in those court cases you just talked about. What is the formula for success that okay. the audience might learn from you right now? Right. Okay. So when we get a case early, and um, this is happening a lot now where we get it on the day the allegations have been made, the right. accusations have been made, or say within a week, or say before police get involved, we can then move really quickly. So the first thing to do is get legal representation. You cannot have an all-rounder in these cases. You need specialist advice. Um, I use specialist solicitors, one particularly. Um, it's done a lot of cases. So the First um, Memory Society would be, be able to pick these out the best, right? Yeah, we, 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 we advise on your legal representation. Okay. Yes. Now, that's your first thing, because obviously, if it's a false memory type allegation, you don't benefit or you're, you're less able to defend yourself if you, within the confines of the prison cell. So it's much better if you preserve your liberty. The second thing that we have to do is do a timeline of events. Yes, so timeline, yes. You're saying to me, right, I remembered I was abused age two. Um, I will advise a person who's been accused of abuse, right, let's go right back to when this person was born. Um, say, we, say we get an allegation which says the person was seven or eight, where memories, you know, the brain's sufficiently formed to remember things, but we need to go right over that whole period any events that have happened, bereavement comes up a lot where people go for counselling after bereavement and then allegedly recover repressed memories. So we mm. do that whole timeline of events. The third thing is people have got to be their own legal advisors. Okay, don't just leave it all in the hands of the solicitor, in the hands of me. Do your bit. Yeah, okay? work hard. Yeah. The BFMS has a very good website, it has a very good legal section read all around it you're the expert on your own life on your own family it's not me it's not a solicitor we were there um so do your own safeguarding and your own homework um what we also try to do is keep people going it's a very lonely dark place when you get accused some people have good support systems around them some do not i spoke to a gentleman um, yesterday who doesn't have a support system around him um, and you've got to keep them going somehow. And sometimes that's by reading about other cases. Yes. Um, a lot of people say I've read your story. And in a weird sort of way, it, it, it keeps them going. But you have to team up with the, the people I work with. If we need to speak to each other on a Sunday with a solicitor on a Sunday evening, we will do. Home numbers, we have various ways of communicating take each other's calls because we know that we wouldn't be getting contact if it wasn't urgent um, so you've got to act fast now where you particularly need help is with the police station interview because if that's a road crash that is your death warrant that is what's held against you when you go to court you're bound by what you say in that interview so you need specialist advice and the yeah. different ways of conducting that police interview um, and you need somebody to advise you on that. If that interview goes well, and, and the case we've been talking about, they obviously have gone well, then we get good results. The worst case scenario for me is where somebody contacts me a month before trial. They've given a police interview. They've used a duty solicitor. Now, I want to be clear here. Some of the duty solicitors are very good. 
you know, I know people who specialise in this area who also work as a duty solicitor, but many of them are all rounders. They may not, not be qualified. They the may situation. not know the theory. Yeah. Yeah. And if you get, if it goes wrong, then, then you then get a legal team who are non-specialists. They may not instruct to write barristers. They certainly won't instruct or even give thought to instructing a false memory expert to look at the case independently, analytically, crit critically, and evaluate the evidence. And then it's a road crash. Then anything can happen. It's one person's word against another. Some of these, is, you know, we, let's, let's go back a bit. So yes. what you've got in, in a court is adversarial process. So you've got the prosecution with a complainant who is now called a victim Remarkably, where yeah. not a victim until conviction, that's the law. But they're saying, you did this to me. And you've got an accused, a defendant saying, it didn't happen. So there's no middle ground. And what we've got to do somehow is get the whole legal process to consider that there may be a third way. Some of these accusers may genuinely, sincerely believe that something's happened to them. But doesn't make it true. And, and you, you, the trouble is, and this is all of us, you find out all these things often when it's too late. Because of the website now, people are finding it much quicker. Yes. Um, they're generally reporting really quickly. They've got one, two, three, four ongoing cases as we speak. Um, one, two, three of those will certainly go to a police interview, in my opinion. But we've got a legal team on it already. They're yes. all constructing their timelines. I speak to them regularly. They have my home number, a mobile yeah. number, the helpline number. Um, and so there's never going to be a block in communication. And you have to go the extra mile and you have to do it quickly. Right. If that's done, then the outcome legally can be good. It doesn't necessarily alter the family situation because even if you're acquitted legally, exonerated legally, if a family member still believes you've done something to them, right. um, the family remains broken. How could we put our minds together today, Kevin, to give advice to people to how to get family members back from what is that what appears to be like a cult? It's like getting right. somebody back out of a cult. Yeah. Okay. So there's no easy answer. What we know is that once somebody's had counseling and develops false memories, and makes false memory type allegations, that can happen very quickly, very fast. What we also know with retractors, yes, or recanters, people, retractors are people who come to realize that their memories of these things are completely wrong and retract the allegation. What we know from them is it takes a lot longer. So to use an example, without identifying anybody, we do have um, a, a, a a couple of cases currently with the BFMS. One person was in counselling for a long time, made allegations against family members. Um, these include very serious allegations. Now that person now realises that these memories are completely wrong and she's completely retracted. Okay, okay completely gone. Um, another family have been reconciliated but the accuser doesn't want to talk about the false memory type allegations. And that person may be embarrassed. Yes, of course. The family members are delighted to have her back with everything that goes with that. However, they're also frustrated because they want answers. They want to talk about it, even though yeah. it's a difficult subject. I mean, it's a yeah, terribly absolutely. difficult subject. Absolutely. We know, we know don't we? Um, we've got a book on the shelf in my life. Um, remind me of the author, Lawrence. Uh, I think it's Maran, um, Meredith yeah, Maran. Maran. Yeah. Meredith Maran, yeah. yeah. So we know from, from that book, which is only a few years old, um, that she came to accuse her father um, and lived her whole life in this sort of culture of, you know, a sex survivor, yes. sexual abuse survivor, and now realizes it's entirely, you know, wrong. Yeah. There's another person in the United Kingdom who initially made allegations in America. I can mention her name because she's in the public um, arena and she's done press interviews, Maxine Berry. But okay. she made very extreme allegations. 
when she, with the help of her very capable husband, I have to say, when, when she came to examine the detail, she realised that they were impossible. She wasn't even in the correct country when that, she made the allegation. So it, it helps if they're impossible, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does. But um, the, the, the people, she's completely retracted everything. Now, um, here's a question. In all of these cases, yep. what helped them get out of it? You know, what well, could what could could we send that same material? Okay, okay. To, to, in that case, case, yeah. In the last case, I would say a husband first and foremost, because he lived with her, yes, and he experienced all these false memories, and he questioned them, and he had the savvy to look at it analytically, even while she was in counselling. And yes. that is not easy to do. No, she's making all these lurid allegations, but he was tight, and he could quietly objectively, empirically, analytically say, well, just look, are these things correct? And they work their way through, and that's the way I describe it. Um, in other cases, what can happen, what we believe happened with my sister, we'll never know because she died in 2005, but um, she spoke to my brother in two separate conversations um, the week before she died, saying she was lonely living in London. She wanted to be come back to the northwest of England to be nearer her family. She said she had no friends in London. And we think that her memories are maybe reordered. If you look at the medical notes, she wasn't on as much psychotropic medication as she had been on. Yes. Um, and we think that her real memories were beginning to compete with her false memories. And that she was effectively retracting the allegations. So in that case, it's a passage of time. Time, yes. Time. And that, that, that is a big one. Um, in other cases, I would say the best thing you can do is don't lose your temper with the accuser. Yes, kindness. Not, not easy. Try to keep some family contact for some time. Sometimes it's a sibling, an auntie, an uncle who they're still talking. Encourage that contact. So you get to hear what's going on in their lives, yes. third party wise. Um, and it's not a satisfactory situation, but you don't entirely lose them. And that yes. person may gradually piecemeal come back to you. It has happened. It's yes. uncommon. It's uncommon. But it, it does happen from time to time. What about YouTube videos that you could send to, to these uh, accusers, you know, that, that are on uh, the topic of false memories, you know? It, uh, what about what about books by Elizabeth Loftus? What, yeah, what, 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 should, what, what do you suggest? It's a great idea, okay? But in theory, when you are so engrossed and locked in yes. to this belief, particularly if it's early, where you, you, you know, you, you, you're six months into it, I don't think anything will persuade these people because it's all out there. This is what we say to family members. This is exactly what we say, what you've said. Um, and in fact... I've just sent out yesterday two membership packs. When you join the BFMS, you get sent a membership pack, which has information that's not on the website about these and, and other cases. And I've sent out two packs. One is to give to another family member who I can't go any further without running the risk of identifying somebody. But yeah. the idea is that person to look at this information because I do think there's a chance that that person may become be able to understand yeah, what is happening with, with information. I guess it doesn't work very often, but it's worth the try. Yeah, it, it, it really is. That's, we always say that, you know, I always offer to speak to the accuser. Yes. Um, always. Um, it's a rare event when that happens, but, but I do. There are other people. We have a professional and scientific advisory board. And from time to time, members of the advisory board will speak with people who've been accused or with the accuser. Yeah. Now, we don't, we don't make sort of sweeping, um, you know, stereotypic generalizations. We listen carefully. Yes. You know, um, I turn down more cases of BFMS currently than I'm accepting. You know? And obviously, we can't make a mistake. There are many genuine victims of sexual abuse. We don't take children's cases for that reason. Um, we, we don't take cases where 
there's no evidence of false memory where somebody yes. says they've been accused and the allegations may be malicious or financially yes. motivated. It may be just a lie rather than a false memory. Oh, yeah. so we, we try to avoid them and we have a number of what Julia Shaw calls red flags. If we don't hit the red flags, we don't take the case. So, so a red flag might be continuous memory. Yeah, a red flag in terms of false memory would. I've been to therapy. I've now discovered um, through counselling that I was abused, age three, and I previously had no memory of it. I've now uncovered all of yes. these memories. And now then what happens is you then get so-called emerging memories where as the counselling goes on, we start yeah. remembering new things and new incidents. They're not real. They're Im images created in, in counselling. Right. Obviously, if we had somebody who says, um, my child is accusing me, she's aged 10. That's not a case we can take. We can't, you know, yeah. we will look at borderline where people are. It's not an ancient, it's not an ancient memory at that point, is it? No, no. And we, we, we can't. And <laughs> there have been some people who phoned the helpline and I've Googled them. And what they're telling me doesn't stack up because of what I found about them. So yeah. we won't take that. We won't take people with criminal convictions for obvious reasons. We try to signpost people, you know, yeah. not to give somebody nothing, but um, we've, we've got to stick to our specialism um, yes. and not go outside of it. That's what I was realizing just over the last day before this interview is that both you and I, Kevin, are not always on the side of a defense, you know, you know. No. Some, you know, we, we're both um, pro uh, uh, law enforcement when, when law enforcement is needed, you know. Well, it, the law enforcement is not a dirty, dirty word. Uh, um, yeah. it, it is needed sometimes. It's not used as often as it should be, in my opinion. Yes. Um, but um, literally, we encourage our advisory board members to work for the prosecution in sexual abuse allegations. Why on earth wouldn't they if we can convict? guilty perpetrators and what on earth is wrong with that? Yeah, it depends um, on the case, right? It depends on the case. Yeah. In some cases, they end up on both sides, defense and prosecution working independent of one and each other. Yeah. Um, they, don't, they don't have to agree. You know, that, that's allowed. There was a case which I was involved with, I think two years ago, the regional prosecutor who came to me for, I think, a prosecution uh, um, defense prosecution expert witness and it was also as it turned out one of our advisory board members was working for defense now they wrote independent statements based on analyzing the files and they concluded that this was indeed false memory type allegations now that case didn't go to trial it was dropped by the prosecution but look at the implications of that an innocent person has not been dragged through a trial the public purse can now be directed towards investigating new perpetrators. Yes. The CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, haven't wasted all their resources on a false memory type case. Police haven't wasted their resources. And we can all focus on genuine cases. Eliminating false memory cases and educating the public so that they know that repression is, is unlikely can actually lead to better prosecution of real cases. Well, they, who benefits from a false allegation? Um, nobody, not, not the agencies, not the police, not the Crown Prosecution Service, not the person who's got false memories and definitely not the accused. But one of the things the British False Memory Society needs to do more of, and that is one of my aims, I've got a piece of work to finish now, but that's one of my aims, is to say more about real sex abuse on yes. our website, in our publications. Um, we should acknowledge more than we have done. I think because we've been so focused in these cases about raising awareness about the topic we specialise in, supporting families who have, you know, been, have false memory type allegations levelled at them, we've not done enough on that front and we, we need to be better at it. Well, taking an empirical approach and a careful approach to cause and effect and and in this case, to the actual percentages, you know, I mean, using good methodology to figure out how prevalent sexual abuse is, is, is a great way forward. What, what I find is a lot of the time people are very much motivated to exaggerate the percentages or to de-exaggerate 
the percentages. So, so a, a careful empirical approach will will help the problem. The yeah, the, the the issue is with with any in in this kind of culture we live in. The issue with any allegation is it, it creates hysteria. So if we look at look at the Carl Beach allegations, aka Nick and Operation Midland. Um, he made wild, I, I don't use this word lightly, it's the third time I've used it, but fantastical allegations against a number of prominent figures, including a former Prime Minister, Sir Edward Heath. And when Northumbria Police eventually investigated Cal Beach, it did not take them very long to find all wasn't as it appeared. That's a better police county than some other areas, right? Yeah, yes, yes, well... The Metropolitan Police have spent a minimum of four and a half um, million pounds um, on Operation Conifer and Operation Midland. It involves another police force as well. Now, some legal commentators think the cost of the trial was a million and a half pounds. There's six million pounds for starters. Yes. Uh, what have you done with all your resources? We've had, at that same time, we've had under prosecution of some problems in society um, in nearby areas, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah well, um, you know. We, think, we're mixed up. Yes. I mean, in our culture, we are mixed up. I mean, you could describe Nick's allegations against the people who accused as a witch hunt. Yeah, it's a it's waste of money. Yeah. Like it, the European witch hunts. Yes. Um, if you go further afield, Sweden and Norway, if you look at the, the, the there's a book, Joe Stetson called The Strange Case of Thomas Quick. Now, Thomas Quick was um, Sweden's most notorious serial killer. He confessed to 10 murders. Um, he, sorry, he was convicted of 10 murders. He was um, literally confessing he'd done 30 murders. Um, they involved, they had the biggest police investigation in Sweden since the Second World War. They drained the lake, they dug up forests, he pleaded guilty to all these murders, and he was convicted. There's only one minor hiccup with it. He actually didn't do any of the murders. That's amazing. He was, he was literally, he had a, 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 a therapist, a psychiatrist, um, the memories of all false memory type allegations. Had anybody spoken to his family, they'd have said, don't believe anything he says. He's fantasy prone. Yes. And he's, he's always been like that. And all of Thomas Quick's convictions were subsequently overturned thanks to a campaigning journalist who showed, amongst other things, that you can't be in two places in the country at the same time and committing two murders. And Thomas Quick read all the newspapers and the police are quite happy to sign it all off because you clear all your murder rates. The worst thing about all of this, all these convictions have been crossed. The, the legal system has had to be entirely reformed with the grassroots change. But what about the real victims of this? Have people been murdered? Yes. And while you're arresting the wrong person, where are all these serial killers who really killed these people? Because people have died. Yes. And you're not even looking for them. So how many right. other people were murdered as a result of incarcerating the wrong person. Uh, if anybody's not read that book, The Strange, Fate, Strange Case of Thomas Quick, you know, it's said with the non-fiction writers in America in the 60s, you know, Tom Wolfe et al, that, um, you know, Norman Mailer, that real life is um, stranger than fiction. Well, it's true if you read that book. One thing I was thinking about from just, just then, as, I, as we were taking a break, was that I, I feel that it's not impossible to win family members back. I think there's, there's always hope if they have succumbed to repressed memory therapy and they've developed false memories and false accusations. And um, I, I think there's always hope because, um, and I, I'll offer some advice on this, um, some advice that helped me. Um, there was a combination of things that helped me turn back from believing in repressed memories like I did from the 1990s to about 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and it needed to be a complete learning for me personally of how to think critically. Otherwise I would have just jumped from one pseudoscience to another. 
So for me personally, I would recommend what I read at the time, which was a book called Science and Pseudoscience in Clinical Psychology, which gives you the skills to learn how to distinguish science and pseudoscience in um, psychology in a way that it can transfer onto other bad treatments as well, not just repressed memory therapy. I also read books like by Mark Pendergrast um, that helped me um, and Elizabeth Loftus on false memories in particular. And I also read a book called How to Think Straight About Psychology by Keith Stanovich. So those, those are some books that really permanently helped me get out of bad critical thinking and into good critical thinking in psychology. And coinc coincidentally, it also helped a, a friend of mine, Monica Pignotti. Um, she's an American um, social worker with a, who got a PhD after she became a skeptic. Um, it helped her stop jumping from pseudoscience to pseudoscience. She started out in Scientology and then she went to thought field therapy. And by reading science and pseudoscience in clinical psychology, she also permanently um, got out of um, the pseudoscientific side of, of psychology. Um, and, and nowadays, I would also recommend um, uh, utilizing uh, YouTube because sometimes it's easier to watch than, than to read. But um, I, I think it's eminently possible to get back family members with, with kindness and information. Um, and um, so, what, what do you think? I, I agree, um, but I, I don't think it's as straightforward uh, as we might think it is. I mean, yes. it, it, particularly with social media now, just as you can read all of that stuff, and I, I would absolutely agree with you, um, but you can also go on there, all the self-help literature that's online. Yes. And it, it, it depends where people are in, in, in the terms of their false memories. At the beginning, when it's all new um, and they get swept away with it. Yes. Uh, Meredith Moran's one. She's a perfect example of what you yes. said. Uh, and there are others. Uh, Maxine Berry's another one. Um, it, it, it can be done, but... Um, we have a we have a kind of um, several files on retractors. Yes, uh, people have retracted the allegations. But since I've been in post, I think it was 2014. If my memory is correct, it may not be. There's been one, two. I think I, I I've come across. Um, yes. So it's, it's it's you know I mean going back to critical thinking. Well, <laughs> everything comes down to that, doesn't it? You know. You can look at lots of stuff online. Yes. Some of it is quite brilliant. Um, some of it um, is not brilliant. Um, and it's having the ability, isn't it, to read it, analyze it, and evaluate the information. Um, yes. We could apply that to everything, couldn't we? We could apply it to politics, um, ev ev every single movement there is. Yes. The evidence. Um, one of the amazing things, I think, is that more people than ever, particularly in the United Kingdom, are university educated. Yes, that's a problem, so, yeah. So we, we should really, you know, intellect should increase. Um, but you'd be surprised, um, I certainly was, when we look at the profile of our accusers, Yes. just how many of them have been university educated. What, what are they not being taught? Um. It, it would appear that, that they, they, their ability to think critical yes. is, is, isn't there. Um, I mean, I don't see this when I, you know, I go into university and as a visiting lecturer. The people I speak to and the students I talk to all appear to have that ability. Yes, it Certainly, might be. Yeah. You know, yeah it, they all seem sensible, intelligent. It might be because they've been... Yeah, it might be because they've been taught by people who are inviting you there, like Chris French or or James Alstott or or, or, yeah. or um, Kimberly Wade. So so they they maybe being taught critical thinking better in their classes than than other places. Yeah, but it, it is apparent in the archive that you know the typical accuser is middle class, as conventionally declined. Yes, normally 
the particular ethnicity, normally whites. We have very few black um, members, incidentally. Yes. Um, and or members of any other ethnicity. Um, in fact, I can count them on one hand. Um, they're normally in the early 30s. You know, Good Johnson said the average age of an accuser in two studies on the BFMS was age 30 to 31. Um, no, age 34, 34. When Julia Shaw and I did a study on the archive with some of the students, we found 30 to 31. Yes. But we can agree that it's in the early 30s. They're normally university educated. Occasionally they have a PhD. That's a scary thing, which I don't understand. Well, well, yeah. well let, let, me, let me offer a, a suggestion. Are these university educated people learning facts? Are they learning to believe the textbooks and not knowing how to critical think? Are they just being taught a pile of facts and the critical thinking course is not there? It, it, it could well be that. I mean, what is astonishing to me is how people can read a text, a self-help text and take the obvious one. The Bible of the Recovery Memory Movement, as it's often said to be, the courage to heal. Yes, by oh, Bass and Davis. Yeah, you can drive a, a hole through that. It could fit a double deck of bussing, particularly on their checklist of symptoms um, for supposed, you know, people who've been abused. But it is astonishing how many people read that and take it in at face value. Yes, I, I have a working theory here, and that is that these individuals who are highly educated have learned a pile of facts at university. They have maybe excelled in science at university sometimes, but they haven't been, but they haven't been told how to know where, why that science was correct, right? So I'll give you an example. I started out in math and physics in the 1990s and at and I was a straightforward believer in math and physics. I didn't have any strange beliefs in math and physics, but I was never taught critical thinking. Um, and I was never taught a key concept of falsifiability. And it comes in other terms too. In philosophy, it's called defeasibility, you know? So, so when I switched over to psychology, I was vulnerable to not thinking about whether the theory I was holding um, touched, um, could have been proven wrong by any evidence. You know, I didn't ask myself, is there any conceivable evidence that could, that could disprove uh, repressed memory therapy or repressed memory theory, I should say. And, and if I had done that at a time, if I had been introduced to Karl Popper's work and what he wrote about, um, 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 Sigmund Freud and, and what um, Scott Lillingfeld wrote about repressed memories and what Elizabeth Loftus wrote about uh, repressed memories. Um, it would have, <laughs> it would have converted me within weeks, but for years and years and years, I didn't have, nobody presented me and um, nobody um, presented me with, um, with that information. And I think the, the, how I was kept away from that information, even though it was available in the 1990s and early 2000s, is the demonization of people who don't believe in repressed memories, mm -hmm. right? So the theory that I was following at the time was that um, beware people who are so repressed that they don't know that repression yeah. exists, you know? Yes. So yeah. um, anyway, I... I um, the, your, your general point is very interesting to me personally. So I did history and English literature at university and as an undergraduate. I can remember one day going into a lecture theatre, listening to a lecture about the merchant of Venice. And we were given an essay, which I did a presentation on in class. It was my turn to do that. And I wrote an essay on it. And my tutor wrote in his comments, he gave me a first class mark for the essay. Yes. But he said to me, did you listen to any, listen to my lecture? I said, I listened to every word of it. He said, and I argued every point he put to me in that lecture, I found a couple of books which argued against it. So yes. there's evidence based. And he said, it's with reluctance and I give you a first this essay, but you've argued your point so well. And we were encouraged yes. to, to be critical thinking. Um, and there were other examples like that. Ironically, nowadays, 
I've come to revise my whole opinion on that that play. And I do think it was anti-Semitic, and I do agree with the tutor. Oh, right. that, okay, yes. Yeah, at that time, I didn't. Um, and but you 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 wouldn't get marked down if you took a, a, a different kind of point of view, as long as it's yes. evidence. You had to put the evidence in, so you can't say what well, I think. You have to give some evidence yeah. and argue with other scholars. And the world would be a boring place if, if that stopped. Yes, uh, 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 criticism is in, incredibly important because I remember one of the around the time I started to think more clearly about psychology, it was criticism from a professor that helped. You know, so I wrote out this uh, theory that was related to repressed memory in one of my essays. And he very kind, I think it's kind of combination of kindness and criticism. And he very kindly said, this is very creative, you know, because he probably had no other students <laughs> who, were, who were coming up with uh, such things. This is very creative, but where is your evidence? And just a little thing like that. Yes. Of, and, and then he said, well, the evidence for pain receptors is not that good. It's, you know, and there's a difference between psychological pain and physical pain. And just that, I mean, if you remove criticism of students it, mm. it, it 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 takes away what they really need you know so um connected to that i think there's been a push in education to not criticize students you know to 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 say that they're always right you know um um and, and in the financial model in universities to keep students happy i don't know if you dare criticize students yeah, it's easy for me to go down this route than you because um, I don't work full time in a university. But, yes. But um, if, if you take broader, I mean, let's look at the number of firsts that are allocated. I remember yes. being at Kew University in the Department of American Studies, doing, as you said, a master's degree in US history and politics and the thesis on lynching in the American South. And David Adams, who was a professor, came into we're in his office waiting for a seminar. He came in, he was quite annoyed. And we said, what's wrong? He said, the department's given five firsts this year. He said, there's going to be a meeting about this. I said, how many do you normally give? He said, one or two. And he was furious. Out of how many? Um, oh, I don't know what the cohort was. It'd be, be in excess of 100. All right, yeah. So. Uh, and he, he was furious. I think it was higher than that. Yeah, I think it's maybe. at 10% now. It's still yeah, not, maybe, it's, maybe it's still, it's still, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's a very yeah. low percentage, but, I think. But, I, he, but yeah. his belief was that one or two outstanding students got a first class degree. Now, I read somewhere, Liverpool John Moores, I think, a few years ago, I think 20% of students got a first class degree. Yeah, now, does that, that sounds that a bit those, high. Does that mean those 20% of students are better, much more intelligent. One of, one of the answers could be as well, is that they're better prepared. I mean, I used to teach um, study skills. Um, nobody else in the department was doing it, but I recognised in my students um, that they, this was at Liverpool Hope University College. They were adult learners who were taking a degree part-time over six years, and they hadn't written an essay, some of them, for 20 years. So I asked them about it, and we factored it in from day one. I forgot the admin out of it. In every class, I had, um, I think it was a three-hour slot, or certainly a two-hour slot, and we did a session on study skills. And when we came to the end of the year, they did exactly the same examination paper. Obviously, it took them twice as long, over six years. But three of my students, and this was a cohort of over 160, one came third, one came seventh, I think the other one was fifth. And the, the head of the department said, What's happened with these students? We've got three in the top ten. I said, well, I've, we've been practicing. He said, practicing what? I said, essay writing, a revision. He said, when did you start that? I said, the second week of the course. Oh, that's good. So we already had a year doing it. Now, then what happened? That backfired because I, I got asked to then set up a departmental learning skills committee. And then I had to go on the university committee and yes. so on. But, but it could be that some of them are better prepared. Yes, um, I don't think that's, that's a full answer at all, but it could be. Um, yeah, yeah the, um, I mean, IQ has been increasing in, 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 in cohorts, um, uh, so that's fair to say. And But what I find is, I think British universities 
at least at Portsmouth, uh, holding the line when it comes to not over assigning firsts. And I'm, I've been quite pleasantly, um, uh, pleasantly surprised by that, you know, so I think it's something like 10%. Um, in contrast to the United States, where, you know, about 30% of students, wow. sometimes more would get a, an, an A, they didn't have the same grading criteria, but about an A, 30% or more sometimes. So, um, so there's still, um, you know, being demanding in British universities, uh, 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 as far as I've seen so far. I, I do remember, and I'm probably going to get slated for this, but we used to teach um, at Liverpool Hope, we had an exchange study programme. And I was the coordinator of that for you. And um, literally, we had a, so our students would go over to the States and do a year over there. Yes. So it was a four year degree uh, before funding cuts came in and vice versa. I do remember having a student on my course who was a professional journalist. And he wrote an essay and I gave him a mark of 57%. Now this guy could write yes. descriptively, brilliant, but he couldn't analyse. And he said, I've never had a mark like that before. So well, you've Welcome got to England. And, and literally, we, we, we went through the reasons. And it was, it was a descriptive essay with no, no analysis. You know, yes. It wasn't evidence-based. That's beautifully written. That's good. <coughs> that's good feedback that people need. And I find it interesting, though, that I was <coughs> a, a, a brilliant student um, at A-levels. And, but yet, I still felt victim to uh, believing in repressed memories and it, and it took a few um, years to recover my career um, because of those beliefs and also um, Carol was also very intelligent too so you know uh, and she fell victim to uh, this belief in repressed memories so um, what could we have been told to help this? No, I, I, I can't comment on your situation, but oh, with Carol, okay. I can say what's happened. Yes. With Carol, she became very impressed by certain people she was around. Yes. She aspired to, for want of a better term, I believe, to move up the class system. Yes. And um, there's, there's, there's a Amazon book review posted, I think in June this year, about the Justice of Carol book. And it says, I knew Carol for 15 years. I always questioned her about her memories and her childhood. And Carol was always very evasive and guarded. And she said, but she held these people up. I'm talking about people like Dr. Fisher. Yes. Dr. Valley Sinison as godlike figures. Yes. And was guarded about them. And she, Carol could hold her own in an argument with her brothers. We teased her a lot. She had four brothers. We used to get a teddy and, throw it above her head and catch it and torment her. Yeah. Um, and, you know, lots of that went on. But she was fine. But when she met somebody, you know, a professional or with a white coat on, she became almost different to them. And she was impressed oh with them in a way that we never were, you know, and I'm still not to this day. That, you know, that, fancy sounding titles don't mean anything to yeah, me. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because... I came out of the Northern, uh, I'm from York, West Yorkshire, and I came from the Northern educational system with this sense of trust of books. So when I picked up books on psychology from the bookstore down at Bristol University, I trusted them completely. And, and I think that was something that was missing. I should not be so trusting of, of evaluating theories coming out of um, A-levels. And I just wonder if we crammed too much information into those A-levels without time to talk about critical thinking, uh, falsifiability, stuff like that, you know. Well, in, in, in history, the first thing you're taught is about methodology and sources. Yes. So who created the source? Is there any benefit from them creating this source? So obviously something yeah, comes from government. Yeah. yeah, any motive. Anything comes from government. We should all look at it kind of carefully yeah. because there's an inbuilt bias to present if you look at political memoirs very often um, all the sins are eradicated they're not in there you know people write their memoirs are they going to say they've messed up are they going to admit that they have flaws and the policies yes. are flawed so you're taught very 
early on to evaluate all the sources. How, how early? Are, are you talking A-levels or in degree level? Um, I'm talking, I didn't do A-level history because the college I went to did my A-levels in one year as an adult student age 28. Yes. Didn't do history. So that was at undergraduate level, first year undergraduate in London. Um, yes. um, but that was the first thing we were taught. Um, yeah. And, and it was the first thing you got into was the sources. And, and that was something that continued yes. that kind of methodology. So in the final year, we did um, uh, an, an option or a module on quantitative and qualitative history and sources. And that was something I took with me. And because I'd done that, I was used to close sort of, um, you know, language, textual analysis from literature. I tried to combine the both of them. Um, and, and it's kind of not a bad pair to go. You know, some, some people think that law and psycholo psychology goes very well together. And, and, you know, Wallach does a law and psychology course, Goldsmiths does. And I think it's a good combination. Yes. Um, and and I'm, I'm a big fan, personally, of, um, you know, doing two subjects and not just one, dual honours, joint honours. Yes. Because um, I do think you can get that broader base you know, ultimately you have to pick, don't you? you have to pick what your dissertations are then. But um, you, you, can, you can do both. Yes. That's so interesting because I think history and psychology have pseudoscientific branches, um, but, they all, but they also have the answer to building up skepticism too. They have brilliant professors who can teach you skepticism in the realm of humans, right? Because history is all about humans. Psychology is all about humans. So if you, would, if you look, look at David Irving, right? Yeah. Who wrote a book denying the existence of the Holocaust. Yes. Um, something for which he ultimately went to prison for. But as a writer, his writing is of the highest standard. I agree with every single word he wrote in that book. Right. But, and somebody, a very, very eminent professor from then at Sheffield University, um, obliterated him in an academic journal. That was David Irving destroyed, quite rightly. Yes, But good. his writing needs to be matched by somebody of the same standard of writing. Yes. But with more intellectual rigor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he believed what he wanted to believe, and we, we don't even need to debate the merits of those arguments. Yes, I, that reminds me of some things that go on in psychology too. Sometimes, genius level brains uh, genius level people get tied up in repressed memory theory and then they apply or, or uh, trauma dissociation and dissociative identity disorder theory and they tell you, they they get consumed with their great intellect at protecting that theory and it yeah. creates great problems for the rest of psychology to debunk them and they're sometimes very productive as well um, one, one, one of the things and, and, it, and, it's, and it's a tragedy that they that they're using their great intellect without being grounded in evidence well i've asked myself this question many times why in the bfms archive why do we have all these people like carol who as you've said <clears throat> very bright intellectual academically qualified um there's some of them real high achievers i mean there are people in there who, who would be in the top 1% in the archive uh, of the country, A-levels and degrees and first-class degrees and so on. And I think what they do is they're really totally focused people. Yes. And when they channel that intelligence into something, they go much deeper than I would go, for example. I think they focus it all when they come to repression or false memory beliefs. They can put so much energy into it that they go into it in a way that the average person just doesn't. Yeah, it's and obsessive. And before they know it, the right caught up and it takes over the whole life because they are fiercely intelligent and more fiercely focused. They put everything into it. All the eggs go into one basket. Uh, yes, that, that, that makes sense. I, I've seen that too. Now, the, a qu I've got an interesting question for you. Um, I remember you were talking about, you talked to a, another psychologist. You, you can mention them if you want who said that, you know, repressed memory therapists are sometimes well-intentioned. 
and 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 then you you came up with another hypothesis um, yeah. that that was not not in line with that okay so i mean first and foremost i do believe that some of these people are well intentioned that some yes. of them i don't believe that you know if we're looking at counseling in general it's set up to help people not to destroy them yes um and i do believe that the vast majority of counselors fall into that category they are there to make a difference and help people but the people who are believers in repression um they believe um it, it's a belief system now i think the conversation you alluded to is one i had with julia shaw yes and um, the eminent and um, erudite julia shaw whose book is on my shelf called i'll give a plug one second one of the books the memory illusion i would yes. encourage people to read it she's brilliant but Julie and I were having a conversation and I can't remember, you'd have to ask her, um, um, I think I was on a stage speaking, um, but I described um, psychotherapy as an industry. Yes. And she said, I would encourage you not to use that term. So she doesn't agree with it, but I believe it is an industry. And I believe it's like baking bread. When you've baked a loaf and he's eaten, you need to bake another loaf. Yes. And another tray and another tray. And there's money in it. It's certainly in private work. Um, and these people are incredibly well connected and networked. There's European groups, international trauma groups. They have annual conferences. Yes. They all have one thing in common. They all believe in the myth of repression. Yes. And they're all earning a living from it. Um, Dr. Fisher, who treated my sister. Um, if anybody wants to find out more about her, just... Google her or Google me. She became head of ethics at British Medical Association. Unbelievably. Her ethical boundaries with my sister were non-existent. And um, evidence for that? Well, first of all, Carol stayed in her home. Second, after Carol died, she insured her car and drove it around it was on the day of the London bombings. She drove Third, Car Carol's car. After yeah. Carol had died. After she died, yeah. Yes. Um, that's not disputed. It's, it, there's a telephone recording on the Justice for Carol website. Yes. Third, she organized a cremation for Carol with no legal rights whatsoever. That cremation was perfectly illegal. We yes. prevented it. Um, not as a coroner has said that they stopped it. That is not the case. And we have the evidence to, to demonstrate that. Um, those things are completely unethical. Yeah. Um, no question. That's not, that's not a professional patient relationship. Um, as my dad is fond of saying, you wouldn't get his doctor to do what Dr. Fisher did with Carol at gunpoint. You yes. know, he simply wouldn't. Um, so so, so yeah. what, 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 is, it, is it the case that somebody like Dr. Fisher um, is unethical to start with? Or do they become corrupted by a theory that doesn't work as well as it needs to. Well, my personal opinion, having known a fair bit about this, is in her case, I would say it's both. Right. It, but I would say in most cases, it's a latter. I'd say the second point is, is correct. With, with, with this person, I think she's an exception to rule. But if you look at the other people who treated Carol, look at Dr. Valley Sinison from the Tavistock Clinic, Dr. Robert Hale. Uh, a colleague in the, in the Tavistock Clinic, they were given funding from Virginia Bottomley, who was then the health secretary in the United Kingdom, to conduct a study of satanic ritual abuse. Now, it's lamentable. You can find it online. It's c completely lamentable. Carol was one of the case studies in that. Yes. Um, um, if you look at... So they had this clinic it, within the Tavistock Centre in London. Um, Valley Sinison claims, and this is 10 years ago or more, to have treated over 400 survivors of satanic ritual abuse. So I would suggest that's 400 families whose lives have been destroyed because of their daft theories. Yes. If you look at another person who Carol saw, um, Vera Diamond, from the Clinic for Autogenic Studies in London. She was a student of Colin Ross, who's oh, well-known yes. in America. Yes, in Texas, sued. I think. Yeah, Yes, and he's been sued. Um, he's lost um, 
malpractice legal suits. But all of these people established careers for themselves yes. based on the back of these theories. And, and they fit in exactly with the second point. Yes, uh, uh, being corrupted by a theory that... Now, now one, one hypothesis I have here is that they become corrupted because it doesn't work as well as it needs to. You know, so if they did have a real treatment such as, you know, setting a bone, which we know works, or such as treating diabetes, you know, if they had a workable treatment, I don't think they would go down this unethical route, right? It's only when something doesn't work that you have to start becoming authoritarian, authoritarian or unethical or, or, or stretching your definitions of what trauma is in order to keep the income going. Well, I mean, for, from the patient's point of view, um, and I, I agree with all of that, but once you're diagnosed, if you're diagnosed as being, say you have a mental health breakdown, which every person um, who comes to BFMS, every accuser seems to have one, and it's diagnosed in your records that you have been a victim of you know, satanic ritual abuse, or you've been an abuse victim, those records get passed on to the next person. You can't undo that history. Yes. You can't ever say that didn't happen because it's seen as, seen as a sign as a mental health breakdown. So once you've been sectioned, um, because these things make you ill, you can't really say, oh, actually, I retract that. And I, I know the case. She's now deceased. Um, and basically, she made allegations, um, similar to Carol's allegations, satanic ritual abuse, I think murder. And an advising member from the BFMS, an advising board member, spoke to her and helped her. And with his support and assistance and expertise, she soon realized that actually all these wild memories and allegations were not true. But there had been an incident. Uh, she'd been in a poor relationship with a controlling person. And that side of things was accurate. So then what happened was, I'm not going to identify her, but she yes. became pregnant. Okay. And she then turned her life around completely and had a lucid mind and wanted to focus on a future life with the baby. But when she retracted the allegations to social services, they said, we're not accepting a retraction. Oh my goodness. We've got your records and this is all true. And when your baby's born, we're going to take that baby off you. So when that baby was born, they took the baby away. And she killed herself. Oh my she goodness. She had, quote, a suicide kit in a locker in a psychiatric unit in which she was in. And she took her own life and she recorded it for posterity. Oh my goodness. None of the things I've told you were even mentioned at her inquest. My goodness. I've got the files. Not one of those things came. So the real reason she took her life is because social services took her baby away. The allegations she made, the retractions, and the baby being taken away from her weren't even mentioned in her inquest. And, and she was the one who made the original allegations yes, of yes. her being abused. Yes. My God, isn't this insane? I mean, why can't people think clearly about these things? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, inquest proceedings are not the big open proceedings we all think they are. You know, it's a very limited thing in most inquests. Who died? How did he die? Where did he die? What decade now, was this? Then when did she die? About four years ago. Four years ago? Yeah. The, the reason I ask is it underlies the need for education to be spread wide about memory distortions, retractions, that, that the idea that retractions are possible, false memories are possible. Um, and we have to undo this idea that you have to believe everything that somebody says. If, if somebody says that they've been harmed, you have to believe them. And this, 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 this idea has come up in recent waves of different kinds of, of belief systems, you know, 
Um, my goodness, what a story. People, I, I, I can remember this because how can you forget it? But also I was looking at her file the other day because I have to redact that file. Um, yes. um, and literally, I was just looking through some of the correspondence in there. It's a terrible story. And you've, you've got the watered down version there. Yes. There's another story beyond that. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it, people believe in all sorts of things, don't they? Um, you sometimes know, I think you just, uh, some, sometimes I think it's just wise to avoid psychologists. You know, I'm a psychologist and, and, and you, well, at least you have to be very careful that you've got a straight thinking psychologist, you know, well, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a slippery slope sometimes. Look at the history of medicine and the history of psychiatry in particular. It's a messy history. Yes. Now in the past, had you made, yeah, had you possessed these false beliefs, you'd have probably been institutionalized, put on a treadmill or put in a straitjacket. At a later period, you may have been given a lobotomy, and that era's not that far away. Yeah. Um, now, what, how can you treat a mind, a broken mind? It's not like you said, a broken arm, you can put a plaster cast on it. Yeah. It's not that straightforward. And there's a whole gray area about treating mental health, which, which is terrible, considering that one in three or four people have mental health problems yeah. at some time in their life. Um, it's and it's no very difficult. Issues. It, 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 it is and also the culture we live in now, um, you know, which I would say the bane in the UK of society is anxiety. Uh, yes. And anxiety is created, I think, as much as it's genetic in terms of pressures on people. Yeah, um, and, avoid, of, and avoidance as well. Yeah, and, and targets, outcomes, outputs, I could go on. Yes, and people true, are under yeah. pressure. The school exam system um, is pressure from day one. And, and no wonder people are anxious. I mean, a lot of children where I live in my local area are now getting anxiety about COVID-19, yeah, yeah, which, which, which is understandable, of yeah. course. But, you know, if we injected our resources into properly qualified professional people, I'm not saying you would eradicate false memory type cases, but you would certainly reduce the incidence of the likelihood of it happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am skeptical of psychologists, but at the same time, psychology contains all the critical thinking you need yep. to navigate this, this, the, the crazy world of, of, of uh, therapies. So, so, so half of psychology has all the tools you need to help guide you through life. And then another, yep. a, a, a quarter of it has this dangerous stuff um, that can do more harm than good. Yeah, and one, one of my favorite areas of psychology, I don't profess to know a lot about it, just things I've read, is eyewitness testimony. Yes. So I previously believed that in an eyewitness identified somebody in a lineup, um, that was it. They'd identified the correct person, but as you know the literature better than I do, if somebody points a gun at you, you're much more likely in that traumatic time period to be focusing on the weapon than on the person. And when asked to describe that person later on, it may not be clear. I mean, I think I've told you this story. I was called to Crown Court as a witness for criminal trial in the 1980s because a wit I'd witnessed a nasty violent incident in the doorway of a pub. And I was sat outside court waiting to be called um, when the person changed his plea to guilty, I'd given a description. Now, I think I was being called by the prosecution, I think, but because um, I'd given the, my statement to a police officer. So the person changed his plea to guilty, and we all went into court, and I thought, well, that's a relief. I don't have to give evidence. And when the accused stood in the dock, I was stuck for words because I hadn't described him I described his friend who was with him. I described him pretty well. Well, he wasn't a perpetrator. I'd actually got the wrong person. Right. So that's my own, you know. So now imagine if I'd have got in the witness box and described this person. And the barrister said, does he look like that person over there inside the public gallery? I'd got completely the wrong person. Yes. 
Uh, yeah, that is exactly an example of, of some of the reliable findings in psychology, which are empirical, right? So you, the, the theory never gets ahead of the, um, the evidence, you know, so, um, and other, other areas of psychology that are useful for understanding the world are things like confirmation bias, which we were talking sure. about, sure. you know, how do you understand, how do you distinguish between cognitive behavioral therapy and repressed memory therapy? Well, part of the explanation is confirmation bias. And we have some great experiments in, in social psychology on confirmation bias and cognitive psychology. Um, so sometimes I feel down about psychology, you know, because we let, you know, dissociative amnesia into the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And then we let dissociative identity disorder into the DSM. Yeah as well. And I start to think, oh, you know, and I forget about all the other tools in psychology that, that are very useful for, 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 for society, you know. I mean, I, I, you wouldn't be surprised, you know, I'm interested in false confessions. Yes. Johnson's book, you know, that obviously, I would be interested in that. I remember seeing, um, I've seen it a couple of times at Goldsmiths University. Um, you know what it is, where I think people are playing bouncing a ball about basketball or something. In the middle, a gorilla walks in. Oh, yes. A person in a costume. And then you're asked to put a show of hands up. How many people have seen it? And three quarters of them, I didn't even notice it. Yeah. You know, the guy walks in in a gorilla costume. Change um, blindness. Yeah, that's called change blindness. And it's a perfect example of selective attention, you know. And there are some solid findings like that in psychology, you know. Have I got this correct? You're asked to count how many people are playing the ball or how many times it gets passed. Yeah, how many like passes, that. yeah. And, yeah. It, and it, works, it works a treat. And it really, I mean, there's so many things like that that you can demonstrate in psychology classes that leads to the student leaving the degree program as a real good critical thinker, you know. Yeah. And it just builds up, you know, you teach them about confirmation bias and you teach them about that. And it's a very valuable degree if it is maintained within the empirical bounds, right? But it could be quite easily be taken over by, you know, uh, critical theory, you know, in so, by some professors, you know, and, and, then, and then the value of the degree would go down, you know. Well, we mentioned Carl Beach early on, a.k.a. Yes. Nick, and his allegations. Well, he, he had, let me get this right, um, I think it was 144, I hope I've not got that wrong, counselling sessions, or 44, 44, with a lady called Vicky Patterson. Right. Now, she, I, I checked her out, obviously. And together they drew a body map, a body map of all the alleged injuries he had. When a home office pathologist who's done 3,000 post-mortems examined him, there's nothing remarkable about his body. The only thing that was ever injured was uh, his wrist, which he'd broken. And that was according to his medical notes anyway. But his yeah. counsel did um, an MSc at um, a well-known university. And if you look at her credentials, there's a giveaway on her website and some of the wording. But if you're not trained to spot that giveaway, which, which takes you to recover memories, she comes across as perfectly professional. Yes. Well, there is a battle to be won in the universities over teaching empiricism and teaching, I don't know what to call it, believe what you want, or everybody's correct, or postmodernism, you might call it, you know? Yeah. And that ba battle is ongoing, but I think psychology departments usually win the battle in favor of empiricism. Um, but um, it's as soon as we lose that battle and start teaching every theory is correct and every, you know, um, then the value of the degree will be useless. You know, so we have to fight to uh, to continue to teach um, uh, good critical thinking. Um, in fact, that's that's a, the biggest um, value of a psychology degree. I think is thinking about critical thinking in the in the realm of humans, and then that can be applied to raising a family. It can be applied to politics. It can be applied to all human sciences. You know, even if you don't become a psychologist. Um, but anyway, I digress a little bit. Now, you we might connect that actually to the question of something you raised twice now with me is um, we assume that 
society is progressing sometimes, but sometimes it regresses and we don't realize it. Yeah. I, I thought that independently of you and you mentioned it. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, if we go back to university attainment, it's higher than it's ever been. So people are better educated. So we'd expect that society will improve with all this education, all this critical thinking that you just alluded to. Yet simultaneously, we have all these crazy belief systems. Yes. Um, we still have a, a widespread belief in memory repression, repression, repressed memories. Yes. We have people who believe, I'm not saying aliens don't exist. I generally yeah. don't know whether they exist or not, but we do have some rather unlikely people yeah. who claim to have been abducted by aliens. I think, I think, um, I think, I think um, the commentator Larry Elder once said that 8% of Americans believe that Elvis is still alive. Yes, ex exactly. And, and Susan Clancy's book, where she speaks to the wife of somebody who believes he's had a baby with an alien. Now, yes. I can't say categorically he hasn't, but I think it's rather unlikely. And there are all sorts of belief systems. Um, I always thought history was safe. I always thought we would be the empiricists, but um, yes. history's been rewritten now. Um, and people are mixing up the Commonwealth with the wider colonialism, and the two yes. are not necessarily the same thing. Well, well, um, well, 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 well they're, they're conflating con colonialism with everything that came out of um, yep. the Enlightenment. Yeah. And, and that's, that's not fair, because the Enlightenment led to an, a different theory that led to the abandonment of colonialism, you know. It led to free market economies, uh, some, of, some of the Enlightenment thinking. And, and it's but, just conflated but, as one. But there's a, there's a lot of weird beliefs about now. Yes. Uh, a lot of new age things where people believe, you know, in the past, in the 1960s, yeah, every 70s, decade, I knew people who claimed that they could um, read your palm of your hand. Yes. My mother kind of half believed in it. You know, we say, if you've got this line here, it means you're going to have four children. If you've got this one, you'll have two. Now we we would laugh at that now. Academ it's yeah, and academics, yeah, and academics, fortune telling, and academics need to help society by saying no. Yes, you know because uh, journalists need to say no. You cannot read people's palms, and same with the emerging belief systems, because that is the only thing that's worrying me about some of the new belief systems is that academ academia sometimes is saying maybe you're right. Instead of, no, that's not empirical, you're incorrect. Um, um, and, and journalists are also doing the same thing, whether um, uh, this uh, kind of postmodern approach to truth, how you develop truth, is gotten into uh, journalism. So, so journalists are not saying, no, that's incorrect, we're not going to print that. They're printing it, you know. Um, so I'm concerned at the moment um, that um, academia and journalism is not pushing back on some of these ideas um, and every decade has these strange ideas which are yes. always to me they're always lacking in a connection to sense data lacking in a connection to empiricism so what the pattern I've seen is they usually unfalsifiable in some way I know I keep on repeating this but they're either unfalsifiable completely or they demonize others that would give disconfirming evidence so that you don't listen to people with disconfirming evidence. Um, well, there's a lynch mob mentality, isn't there? I mean, yes. the other issue which runs along with this is moral panic. So if you look at Cohen's classic study on, you know, mods and rockers, we, we, you can say we've had a moral panic about child abuse. Yes. And it's, it's one that's lasted for a few decades. And within that, you know, I say, well, just because we're saying one case might not be true, we're not saying all cases are untrue, but it's getting harder and harder. And for the BFMS, we're caught between a, you know, a sort of um, rock and a hard place on this. Yeah, um, both, both are painful, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I don't believe there's anybody in the BFMS or any professional members who don't abhor child abuse. We yes. all do. Why wouldn't we? Yes. But just because we're saying that these allegations are false memory type allegations, we're not saying 
um, the majority of cases are not true. Of course, yes. most of them will be. And that's, that's it's a real difficult thing because society swung so far now. And we've had this discussion before, I know, but my PhD was on um, late Victorian Edwardian England on violence. And there was a chapter on sexual assault. I think it's the weakest in the book because the sources were the weakest. Yes. However, women were badly let down by the criminal justice system. Now. Yes. Even one woman who was in Staffordshire raped in the street by some soldiers with witnesses. Yes. Even she, even they were not convicted at Crown Court. They were acquitted. It was a dreadful decision. That's terrible. And there were other, other cases like that. Uh, and women were let down by the criminal justice system in any allegation of sexual abuse for decades, yeah. probably over 100 years. Yeah. And the sexual antecedents was dragged up. They were lambasted, ripped apart under cross-examination. So it was terrible. Yeah. But it's gone from that over here, and it's lurched over here, particularly Paul Savile, whereby now anybody can make an allegation, and the police are calling them a victim. Yeah, even before there's though, evidence. Yeah, even though Judge John Rikis has recently ruled, the former High Court judge, that you are the complainant when you initially make the allegation. And everybody in the 2,308 assault trials in my doctorate, everybody's called a complainant. Yes. You weren't put down as a victim, but it's now, gone from here to here. And it's got to come in the middle, surely. Now, did I understand correctly? Do they now call them victims officially? Yes. Oh, well, uh, even uh, before even evidence? Though, yes, even though the official guidance is that they... Uh, complainants and the Metropolitan Police, who do tend to dig themselves in, have uh, said recently, in fact, it's something I'm about to write about in a newsletter for BFMS. I said, so, Well, just because we're calling uh, victims, we're not conferring any victim or status on them. Well, of course you are, because if you're saying somebody's a victim, then you don't even have to look for a perpetrator, they're right in front of you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very suggestive to call them uh, victims before the evidence has been um, um, assessed. And it's so important to do that, um, to assess the evidence carefully. Um, you know, sometimes I feel that we have to, every, every um, generation, every decade has to struggle to maintain what we've achieved, you know? So yes. due process of law, we, I, you know, a decade ago, I thought, oh, that, everything's getting better you know, um, uh, assumption of innocence, um, um, the scientific method, you know, STEM, um, science, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I it, it just occurred to me recently that we have to work quite hard to win the argument every generation that empiricism, careful thought is, wins out over emotion, basically. If you, or, if you look at what you've just said, law and due process. Well, the criminal justice system, I can say this without fear of contradiction, yes. is not broken, it's beyond broken. Right. Now, COVID-19 has put the icing on the cake. It's it was in a bad it. way anyway, but the Times reported the other day that there may be backlogs of criminal cases five years. Other commentators five years. ten years. Um, certainly, we had a retrial after going through the Court of Appeal three times last summer, which is scheduled for March, the week before lockdown. And that's now been moved to January, My goodness. if it goes ahead then. Um, and it, 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 it's impossible to overstate the impact of the public sector cuts on the legal system. A lot of criminal solicitors have gone out of business. And there's a real fear now, and I was talking to one yesterday about this, and to another one last week, that loads of firms are going to fold um, as a result of COVID-19 because the solicitors are not parting with any money. Yes. They need to hang on to what they've got. All the trials have, have collapsed and been postponed. Um, so there's no work. There's been no police station interviews, or very few. Where they have, they've been remotely done. There's no prospect of criminal trials just now. Yes. Um, and then you've got this massive backlog. The barristers are not working. They're not getting briefed from the solicitors. Yes. They have overheads in chambers, and then they're not cheap. You have to pay that. If not, you're out. And 
it, it's, it's going to have an impact. Um, so, so after COVID nineteen, what what, yeah. what 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 do you think the solution is to improve the criminal justice system? Well, first of all, you've got to resource it. Funding, uh, yeah. So don't don't. Yeah, are you saying don't defund the police? I'd, I'd say definitely, definitely fund the police. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. If we if we get to a situation as some people have said, where we defund the police, we're going to have lynch mobs. I know about lynch mobs. I, I, I've studied them, and it is not pretty. Yeah. Um, and once you get to lynch mob the, the mentality, then all bets are off, and people have to yeah. fall into groupings to protect themselves. Like yeah. all the, the science fiction films you've seen, it will become a reality. Oh, and well, please, we've seen it. We've seen it. We've seen it hundreds of years ago. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, pl the police will be, need to be massively funded, but the whole criminal justice system, a, a very experienced solicitor told me, he asked me a question. How much do you think I get if I write a letter of the legal aid for a client? Well, I'll tell you the answer. £3.24. Wow. So how, how can you make money? So in legal aid work, in criminal law, they're losing money. And in order to take, this is another conversation I had with a leading solicitor in Scotland um, just a few weeks ago. In order to take the legal aid cases, they have to do sufficient private work to offset it. They yeah. want to do the legal aid, but they can't survive purely on legal aid. They have to eat. They have to run an office. They have to pay the bills. They have to commute. And it's so underfunded. Um, there's an article, um, there was a programme on Channel 4 last week by Secret Barrister. Secret Barrister has written a book about the criminal justice system um, anonymously. Yes. And um, in, 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 in that book, he or she, we don't know the gender of this person, um, and, and in that broadcast by Channel 4, it's described how bad it is. And, and it, it's quite unbelievable. It really is. Never mind the issues about disclosure, non-disclosure, late disclosure, um, unused evidence. They don't get read. Barristers don't get paid to read something called the unused material. So the unused material can be like that. It can be like that. And it's all the information has come together in the case file that the prosecution don't want to rely on. Now, Liam Allen, which is the case that may be known to some people, and I know Liam, was a student accused a couple of years ago of rape. He was at trial. If convicted, his life was finished and he was going to prison. His very brilliant barrister stayed up all night, left her husband and children all asleep, and went through the unused material and found all these text messages. I'm talking hundreds, if not thousands, of the complainants, yes. which completely undermined the prosecution's case. Yes. And when the prosecution saw them, they pulled it out of the case. And that case was reported in the national press and particularly by David Brown in the Times newspaper. Um, so you've got to fund the criminal justice system. Then you get into other debates. Now, I've always been. A jury, a jury fan. There's now some suggestion because of COVID-19 that the case is going to be heard by a judge only. Probably that will happen or to reduce the jury like they did during the Second World War to seven people. Um, and obviously, if you have seven instead of 12, the danger is you get a narrow mindset. One or two people can dominate. Yeah, so, so there's some suggestion cases now under COVID-19 will be heard by a judge only. There's some suggestion that it will be heard by a jury of seven. Nobody knows yet. But I would say we're now getting to the point where, irrespective of COVID-19, we need professional jurors, um, where we need to have professionals. And we need a statute of limitations. So yes. whereby... If somebody's making allegations they keep dating back to the 50s, we've got to have a cut-off point. Somewhere. That is a very difficult political stance to take. Yes. You know, if you yes, if you if if you if you're within a organization that's very sensitive. Mm. So it, I mean, how can you make the argument for a statute of limitations when the counter argument will be um, don't you care about victims of crime? Yeah, I mean, the legal profession are divided on it. And the last time I had a discussion was with two solicitors, a solicitor, a barrister, and myself. And each three of us, we all had a different opinion. 
Yes. But I would go for statute of limitations, three to five years from the age of majority. Um, yeah. and, and you know, maybe a, age, age, age of mature, maturity at 18? Majority, majority. So being able to roll 18. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Yes. You know, I'd say seven years and maybe you know, five years from the age of majority. But we, we are now investigating allegations against dead people, Edward Heath and others. We're yes. investigating allegations which are dating back, my own allegations dated back to the 1960s. Yes. There are no witnesses to these things. And I do think we'd be much better focusing on contemporary allegations and more recent allegations. Um, it's practically impossible for somebody to defend themselves adequately when the cu accused of events 30 to 40 years ago, and even in true, the very nature of these offences, I mean, there's no witnesses to it. So yes. how can you defend yourself if somebody says, 30 years ago, you put your hand on my leg, or 30 years ago, you raped me. It's not yeah. possible. Um, and so the, the defence is just disadvantaged at every level. That, that Add to that the legal aid cuts. Yes. You know, it, it's virtually impossible in these cases. Um, and secret barristers said it's now got to the point where only those with money can defend themselves. And if you haven't got the financial resources, you can't get a fair trial. Yes. It's interesting that you do see a pattern of a lot of um, accusations of abuse um, being directed at very, very wealthy people. Um, and sometimes that might be a motive, or in other cases may not, may not be a motive. Well, you've got different kinds of allegations. You've got false memory type allegations, yes. which are a distinct minority, but an important minority. Yes. You've got false allegations where there can be a lot of reasons for that. It could yeah. be financially motivated. It could well be malicious. Some people are fantasy prone. It could be a combination of all of those things and often is these days. Yeah. Um, if you report to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority and particularly if the police support your application, whether the person you're accusing is convicted or not, you are liable to compensation of £23,000, which doubles to £46,000 if you can show, if you can demonstrate that you have an enduring mental illness. Um, and you would be staggered at the money that has been paid out by that authority yes. with little scrutiny. So the, pe people do make allegations for all sorts of reasons. Yes. Um, now, I wonder what, what is the extent of the problem of, of false memories? Like, so the reason I ask you in particular is you told me um, that you've looked through thousands of cases recently um, over the last uh, few years, and it's given you a unique insight as to what the problem is in, in the UK um, yeah. with false memories. How prevalent is it? Um, what's the kind of the size of the problem? Okay, so the BFMS archive had a, an archive of about three and a half thousand individuals. It's probably now 3,700, 3,800 with the cases I've taken. Yes. So they've come to the BFMS um, saying they are the victims of false memory type allegations. So I've been through this whole archive. It's largely redacted. Some of the bits of information I have, somebody makes a one-off telephone call. We don't hear from them again. Um, and there's no meaningful information in that file. Then it's been destroyed. Now, it's easy for me because our caseload is lower than what it used to be. And I'll come back to that. To monitor these cases nowadays and to kind of um, find out the outcomes. But if you go back to 1993, where I think we had 260 cases and pretty much the same the following year, that caseload, 520, 530 cases with a small team, is virtually impossible one person initially to keep on top of. So the peak of false memory type allegations which came to the BFMS was in the early 1990s. It gradually declines over time with a few peaks and troughs. And um, one of the things I'm doing just now is counting because you, you get, 
your number of cases depends how you count them. We haven't been counting since I've been into post, I don't think, the number of cases that we turn down, for example. So if you want to get a true idea of how many callers you're dealing with, you need all of that information. So I'm going through all the files again. It's impossible to know. And also, if you think about in the past, we have a very good website now. Pre-internet, how would you hear about the BFMS? You might get lucky. You might find some information on it. You may read about it if it's been in the press, which it was, 94 to 97, quite a lot. But you simply wouldn't know about yeah, it. Yeah, I missed it. Now, you, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't read about it in 94, 95. Yeah. Now, nowadays, you can probably find it on the website, presuming you're computer literate. Yeah. If you're elderly and you've been accused, you might not be. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the prevalence, it's interesting, isn't it? It Our caseloads declined. But to the point where already this year, we have, when you contact us, any new caller, we write up a telephone information sheet. Already this year, in spite of lockdown, and in spite of me being in furlough for a couple of months, I've written up 16 telephone information sheets. I still have others to write up. Yes. So that tells me our case is not going to decline this year. And I've got a strong suspicion it's going to get quite heavy towards the end of the year when the courts get going and the police are interviewing. Um, so we, we can't know the, the true number. It hasn't finished. It's not finished. Now, yeah. there's been studies in Europe. There's one by Julia Shaw and a colleague. There's another one where you one of the co-authors with Henry Oxar. Um, and Julia Shaw's just written another paper, quite a detailed one, where it's suggested that false memory beliefs in Europe is on the increase. And these studies are based on wow. the UK, the Netherlands, is it France? Yeah, um, France. And is it Belgium? I can't remember. I don't know. I, I did mine in the United States and, yeah. and yeah. beliefs about I've got, repression I've got were all quite high. In, I've got all the papers in my office, but yeah. there's a strong suspicion that belief in it is increasing, not yeah. decreasing. At, that's least a it's scary the, thing. It's, it, at least the majority of people seem to believe that repression is possible and that traumatic memories are often repressed is what was one of our questions. So, you know, for example, I think it was 80% of the American public, 80% of the UK right. public uh, uh, believe in that. So it, it, it all comes to all of this is some kind of loose evidence that that it's still a problem today and and the 16 cases that you've heard about this year may be just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this belief system causing problems in society so it doesn't have to go to the it doesn't have to rise up to the extent of a false accusation to be a problem because sometimes you just believe that you've got repressed memories and it and it damages your life um and how many thousands or millions of people believe that they may have repressed memories may be something that is, we, we we haven't yet measured yeah i think the closest you come to is a study you've done with mark pendergrass a copy of which is on our website where right. he looks at the impacts in the states and conjectured outwards, projected outwards, and um, we're talking millions, aren't we? Yeah, um, um, at least more than a million if if we extrapolated correctly. And those were not; those were still the tip of the iceberg, like I was saying. So those were people who had actually been through therapy, actually recalled something that they did not know about before, and then they reported it in our study. So maybe I think it was like. 5% of the population or 4% of the population, which is a lot of people um, of a sample, I should say. But all of the, but we, but we, it's given me an idea for another study, actually. We haven't measured how many people believe that they have, they, that they could possibly have a repressed memory. Yeah. And just yeah. believing that you could possibly have a repressed memory forever puts your parents in this kind of gray zone of, Maybe they're really evil. Maybe they're not. Mm. And then you could go for the rest of your life believing that and, and, and your parents don't understand why you're so distant, you know. It's interesting you, you, you're talking about the statistics because 
it's one of the things I've come around to, but you've just got to be better at the methodology in terms of counting. So when I finished with getting this year's files up to date, I'm, I'm going back to last year's and just running through those cases again. Um, I mean, we, we currently have, we're in excess of over 100 live cases. Yes. If you're counting people who've been accused over the last few years, um, most of them don't go to court. And we tend to have a traffic light system with prioritizer ones where there's a likelihood of police being involved or there's legal, um, you know, it's an illegal kind of situation now. Um, but it's, it's just something we need to get better at, just, just accounting. And then the kind of questions you're asking there need to, need to be asked. And all the memory surveys that have been done some of which have had rather alarming conclusions and statistics. It, you know, it's caveat temptor, isn't it? We should be looking at those with alarm. When you go back to legal system, how do we improve it? Well, one of the things that surely must be done is better training for legal professionals in terms of memory, not just false memory, how memory functions. It yeah. doesn't work like a video recorder. And somebody may recall something that 30, 30 years ago in incredibly vivid detail, but that vivid detail may, may more than likely mean that the memory is not accurate, not the yeah. opposite way around. Yeah. And, and that, there is a big hole there in terms of the training um, around legal professionals. Yeah. Yeah, just, just, to, just to mention of the statistics, I, I think we could get more accurate and accurate as we do follow-up studies. Like, for example... There's um, obviously a sampling, selective sampling when it comes to looking at the data in the British False Memory Society, uh, but it's still very, very valuable, even if there's got wide, you know, margins of error yeah, from yeah. from it being a small sample, from perhaps some phone calls going missing, like you were talking about. Yeah. It's still it's still valuable in the first step of of trying to figure out an hypothesis, you know, so you don't come to a conclusion from those rough statistics, but it gives you great ideas of yeah. a, a, for, for doing an, a bigger study on statistics. Or I'm something. doing some work with Goldsmith University at the moment, and we've almost finished a sampling now. I've just got to scan them some more recent files, and then we have a really good sample of cases. The same has been done with Glasgow Caledonian University. Now, if that goes according to plan, and that's written up and published, that should move us on quite a bit, you know, at a basic level. Um, it's not, not going to transform our knowledge of anything, but uh, it's certainly in terms of the cases we get, the legal outcomes, which is something I'm particularly interested in. Yes, yes, th those cases are very interesting. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing that. Oh, yeah, there was one, something I wanted to ask you about, and that is multiple personalities, hmm. you know, so um, an extension of this idea of repressed memories is, which is perhaps even more fantastical than repressed memories, is the idea that people develop multiple personalities in such a way that one personality does not know what the other personality does and they encounter missing time from the time that they had switched from one personality to another. Um, so the, one of the first questions, I would just kind of want to get your take on it, and, but, but we might start at, at, at asking you, if I remember correctly, that I think that was part of Carol's case. Is that correct? Yes, Carol was diagnosed with multiple personalities. And there's one medical record where she sat in the back of the car with one of the therapists called Vera Diamond from the Clinic of Autogenic Studies in London. And Carol's been taken to the bottle bank it's one of the most depressing notes in the whole file, to be honest, to smash bottles because one of the personalities is threatening to, to kill her, that, you know, is, is threatening to take her life. And um, it's complete psycho babble. It's... Um, but it is an industry that now it's, you know, dissociative identity disorder. But yeah. it, it is such a nonsense. I mean, Rosie Waterhouse, a journalist, um, who works a lot for Private Eye, I can't remember where she published this, it was in the mainstream press, published a piece a couple of years ago, the woman who's convinced she has 48 personalities. 
I mean, come on. Um, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the are you telling me that the journalist was credi credulous to this? The journalist was sceptical in the extreme. Oh, extreme, well, like that, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that might be helpful. It was a critical um, article about it. But it, it, it's so ridiculous, you know, it, it, and it's not, it's not scientific. And again, it's the same group of counsellors who keep getting these people. Yeah. Uh, and again, once you've, once you've got somebody to believe that has happened to them through therapeutically induced treatment, in inverted commas, then their life is over. If you actually go around with all these things going on in your head, and the idea that these personalities can talk across each other, have different behavioural treat, traits, I mean, it stretches one's imagination beyond breaking point. Um, yes. It really does. Now, now here, is, here is the problem that you may come up against if you were to um, make that argument. And this is, this is something you see in other movements as well. If you criticize the category in the DSM, dissociative identity disorder, yep. yeah. how do you counter somebody who says, I have dissociative identity disorder and you are under, undermining my validity as a human being? There's not a lot I can do about it, is there? I, I, I'm entitled to my opinion. It is not my fa fault that it's made its way into DSM. How on earth that happened, again, um, is incredible. But you're not responsible for the whole world. You can do your bit. That person believes she has multiple personalities. I believe she doesn't. I'm not trying to malign anybody, to marginalize anybody, to harm them. I just don't accept the diagnosis. And right. that's my personal and professional opinion. Well, you, do, you see, do you see how this works, right? So yeah, of course. You're, yeah. you're criticizing... Yes. A scientific category. Absolutely. And they're taking it personally and you get caught in this, yep. in this web of saying, of, 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 oh, no, no, I'm not attacking you personally, you know. And how can you have a scientific discussion when somebody says, oh, I, are you saying that I don't exist? And, and it's, it's no, no, we're not saying that at all. I mean, just, just imagine this, um, Kevin, if... I said, I'm not so sure that the, um, the category of depression is the best category. I think we should rename it or, or change the, the criteria. And then somebody with depressions came along and said, are you saying that I don't exist? No, no, you're a very valuable person. You're a very valid person. It doesn't mean that the person doesn't exist. Um, but this, this is a new, a new, a new uh, way of arguing in, in the world. Yeah, it is. It, it is. And you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. I think that's yeah. what you're saying. Now, but before we go, why don't we think about how do we know, why do we think that um, dissociative identity disorder is not the best category? Well, it, it defies logic, doesn't it? It defies common sense. Um, and it leads on to something else. One of the problems with all these diagnoses is um, PTSD is in all the files. Now, my sister is supposed to have post-traumatic stress disorder. When you look for that diagnosis, it's never been given. It's never been made by a doctor. It's a therapist who says she had PTSD. It's my opinion with PTSD that most people who have it don't get diagnosed with it. Um, they have it, and it's not. It's, and certainly in our archive, it's coming up more and more. Um, now, but all of these people stay ill. They remain ill. Nobody ever gets better. That's that's one of that's an absolute certainty in the archive. The odd retractor, um, but they have mental health problems due to the therapeutically in induced kind of um, you know imaginations and, and allegations. But they don't get better. They don't improve. I mean, why 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 haven't we got a treatment? If you talk about DID, whereby you're treated and you get better, why do they never get better? How can we have a product where you have all this input? My sister was in counselling for 20 years. At yes. what point do we say, right, you, you've improved or you're not going to improve? Do we go on for another 20 years? 
Uh, and that's one of the things that shocked me, both with her records and with other records I've seen, just how, how many sessions do you actually have to have? Um, you know, surely cognitive behaviour therapy is about the here and now. And they'll look at your problems and they'll say, right, what, do you, what are your goals? What do you want to change? I know somebody's having it at the moment. And it, her counsel is quite brilliant. Yeah, and it's it really, fairly straightforward. It really helping her. And let's not focus on the past. Let's focus on the here and now. Um, but you have an outcome. The outcome is to improve your quality of life. But all of these people remain ill forever, it would seem. So you've, you've, get, you've guessed I'm not a fan. No, well, I mean, it does defy logic and, and common sense. And you have to think of... There's, there's two things that, that I have problems with with DID. One is where in the brain are these individual personalities exactly, exactly. operating when we have no converging evidence from physiological psychology of, of, of any of these areas of the brain? It doesn't look like that's the way it happens. Like There's connections from the hippocampus up to the frontal cortex, and but there's no there's no kind of separating out of different personalities. That's, and, and so it's, it's a very difficult thing to debunk because you have to look at evidence not converging with it rather than, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit like religion. You know, you look at evidence that's not converging with it rather than a direct debunking of it. And the fact that there's a kind of social history to it and that it didn't seem to exist before Freud's theory of, um, of repression, right? So if a disorder is real, you'd expect it to maybe come up in ancient literature in, in the Greek society, but you don't get that in dissociative identity disorder. Um, well, you don't seem to get, do you, pre-Freud? You don't get repression. Where is it in history? That's right. You know, where is it in literature? For example, that, that's right. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it started to emerge a little bit before Freud in a romantic era novels as, yeah. as, a, as a literary device in fiction, yeah. I think, you know, not, not long before Freud. And it started to be formulated by some of the hypnotists that Freud went to. Oh, yes, I know about that. Yeah. Went to yeah. see in, in France. And then he just expanded the idea. As far as I can tell, I'm open to changing these ideas. Um, but one of you can see dissociative identity disorder start to formulate in in a, a 1906 paper by Morton Prince, where he just lays out a case study, and we know how unreliable case studies are, of somebody um, dissociating and then and then reporting different personalities, you know, and it is a difficult minefield to get stuck in because yeah. I know the counter arguments against what I'm saying right now. And I, and I feel very sorry for individuals who get caught up in this craziness because a counter example might be somebody from the late 1700s where somebody had something that looked a tiny bit like multiple personality disorder, but it wasn't multiple personality disorder. And so, like I was saying, I, I just have a lot of empathy for uh, people who are stuck between these two arguments, you know. But I think our talk helps illuminate some some of these things, um, along I enjoyed with it, Lawrence. A, along with hundreds of other um, um, pieces of books and and articles that people should read um, to help debunk these ideas. So, uh, thanks for joining me, Kevin. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, and bye for now.